Hey guys, you guys okay? How are you guys doing? All right, all right. Hold on. <clears throat> Just trying to get the sun out of your way. What's up, Magdalene? Nubian princess. How you doing? How you guys doing? Okay, Andy Ray, are you asking a question or you're trying to create a contradiction? Matchek is basically. Uh, yeah, how do you know that, Mad Sheikh, Muhammad Sheikh? What's up, Cabello? Because your your question is easy to answer. It's not. It's, there's no contradiction. It's a misreading of those passages. <clears throat> so I want to give everyone a minute before we begin. Andy Ray, you, you ask a question. Are you asking because you want to know the answer? Just before I begin, a little tired yeah, as usual. I'm always tired. I don't know why. A person asks a question, and when I try to get his attention for clarification, they don't answer. How you doing, Light? God bless you, sister. Good to see you again. Before you guys ask me questions, there's a few questions I want to answer, and then I'll open up for your questions. I know you are, Derek. Okay, brother. Andy, I'll answer your questions. So, guys, I'm going to answer questions. Andy, raise question I'm going to answer. That's a very good question. So, Andy Ray, remind me of your question because I'm going to answer something first. I'm going to start off by answering one specific question, and then I'm going to answer <clears throat> successive questions. So, Andy Ray, your question I'm going to answer definitely. I even have an article on it. But, guys, just bear with me and be patient with me. Be patient with me. Bear with me. Help me to help you because I can't keep up with all the questions. So, it's not I'm ignoring your question. Thank you, Colin. God bless you. So, Andy, make sure I answer your question. It's a good question. I have an article. I'm going to give it to you, all right? Do remind me of the article, please. Don't leave here without me giving you. I got a few articles I want to share with all of you guys. Wait for a few moments and do pray by the grace of Jesus Christ that God rejuvenates me, reinvigorates me. Then I tell you that I'm going to start getting attacked by the demons. And the attacks already started. The sons of Satan already started. Anti-Trinitarians already started. We have... And again, I don't know if I should even mention this, and I really don't care, but I will mention it. And I pray that the Lord Jesus is allowing me to mention it because I don't want the Lord to be grieved. I just found out this morning, you know that guy, don't convert to Islam, Ishmael, <clears throat> Abu Ismail. I just found out that he came out with a video slandering me because he took information from Muslims who went into my divorce docket the divorce and then took statements from my ex-wife's lawyer slandering me accusing me of making a lot of money that i don't make in order to make me look bad and make me pay more for my ex-wife and so he took that information and he now made a video and he doesn't understand it's going to backfire against him it's going to backfire against him because people are going to see he's a disgusting son of satan a dog, a tool of the devil, because anyone who's been through divorce, unfortunately, I hope you haven't, realizes that the lawyers of the opposing parties is going to try to make the other person look as bad as possible. But can I tell you why he's doing that? Can I tell you why he's doing that? And I don't want to give him attention, so forgive me. Forgive me. I don't want to give him publicity, so Lord Jesus, forgive me. I'll tell you why. I was one of the first to expose him for being a heretic. Did you know that he's, a, he's an anti-Trinitarian modalist who got baptized by a oneness modalist pastor who's an anti-Trinitarian? And he hid that from Trinitarians because he was asking Trinitarians to support him financially, to send him to Bible college, and to keep him in ministry. And then when I found out that he got baptized by a false Christian, a heretical group that denies the Trinity, I called him up on it. I challenged him to debate, but he didn't debate. And you know who came to his side? You know who came to his defense? An anti-Trinitarian, oneness heretic pastor named Stephen Ritchie. And I challenged him to debate, and we debated. Go to Acts 17 Apologetics. Acts 17 Apologetics. There are two debates on Acts 17 Apologetics, between me and Stephen Ritchie, who's a oneness modalist pastor, the debates were, does the Old Testament teach a trinity? Does the New Testament teach 
the Trinity. And glory to the triune God, glory to the Lord Jesus, the pastor was decimated. I have to be honest. I'm not trying to be arrogant. Because you cannot win defending a false god and a lie. Sadly for the pastor, he died over a month ago. He died. And I hope he repented and came to the knowledge of the true God. So this pastor came to the defense of do not, don't convert to Islam because he's too much of a coward and he doesn't have the guts to debate his false god, his demonic doctrine. So what does he do? He goes on the slander campaign. That's why David Wood, Al Fadi, James White, and others do not endorse his ministry. In fact, not a lot, lot too long ago, there is there's something that takes place on Twitter where you have this monthly apologetics marathon where you vote for your favorite apologist. And the last one, he was one of the candidates. And James White found out and told the person running it, this guy's an anti-Trinitarian, and they removed him. So he's now angry and livid and trying everything he can to attack and discredit me and others who've exposed him for being a false Christian, a heretic, a son of Satan, a dog of the devil. So, folks, that's why he's doing what he's doing. Hey, then this is now three times I said it. Don't convert to Islam, this uh, the YouTube channel. So he is not a Christian. He's a son of Satan. He worships a false god. His God is not the true God. It's a demonic doctrine. So instead of debating me, in fact, call him out. Guys, can you do me a favor? So instead of slandering Shimon, put him in his place intellectually, theologically. Debate him. Someone asked me recently, would you debate the guy? I said, he won't debate me. He's a coward, and he won't debate. He's not a Christian, folks. Shamir, the former Muslim from Canada who goes by the name of Abu Ismail, don't convert to Islam. Yep. So what does he do? He goes on the slander campaign. And the guy thinks that I'm going to lose sleep because you decided to take snippets from a divorce trial that tries to make me look bad in order to make my ex-wife look good. I'm going to lose sleep, guys. You see, I'm losing sleep now. All right. And guys, forgive me. I didn't want to mention him, but I felt the need to mention because what did I say last night? I said last night I'm going to get attacked. Last night, Satan is going to prick his children, his sons and daughters, to attack me, to try to discourage me. So, guys, I need you to covenant with me. I need you to bathe me in prayer and my daughters in prayer. I need you to ask the Lord Jesus to save us, preserve us, transform us to be more like him, and let him fight our battles, and we just focus on glorifying Jesus Christ. I need the Lord Jesus to protect my daughters and I. Because the gentleman doesn't understand, if he gives away too much private information, he can be exposing my daughters to, to jeopardy because it just takes the wrong Muslim to find out where my ex-wife lives and do some harm to, the, to her and my children. But see, they don't care because they are sons of the devil, dogs of Satan. Right? They don't care. The Lord Jesus, who loves my children, the Lord Jesus, who's the Savior of my children, the Lord Jesus, who protects my children, may he arise to judge and chasten and rebuke him as the dog he is for exposing my children to harm. But anyway, with that said, let Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glorified. Okay? Brother, you obviously haven't, big sofa, you obviously haven't been following my channel, have you? Stop who from posting. Who do you want to stop posting? I don't get it. Uh, Anna, who are you talking about? I have no idea. My neighbor's music is blasting, so pray for me. I, Anna just threw me off. Who's calling me names? I don't see anybody calling me names. Oh, yeah. Well, I don't see him because I've already blocked him. So, oh yeah, by the way, the Bible refutes heretics. He's a oneness demon, a son of Satan, that that is helping Abu Ismail. He's, he's actually one of his comrades. Yeah, like I said, you can get rid of him. If he's distracting you guys, get rid of him. If you're being distracted, get rid of him, because here's my policy. As long as someone doesn't blaspheme God, as long as someone doesn't blaspheme God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, as long as someone doesn't attack the Word of God and mock and insult, and as long as someone, another rule, doesn't justify abortion, 
the murder of unborn children, if they want to attack me, fine. But if it's distracting you, if it's distracting you guys, because I'm here to serve you, and I'm trusting the Lord Jesus to give me the grace to exercise perfect self-control so I can overcome my weakness in my flesh for the glory of Jesus. But if it's distracting you guys, get rid of him. If it's a distraction to you guys, get rid of him. Distraction to you guys. Get rid of him because I don't want you to be distracted. I don't want you to be distracted. That's why I get upset when people go into side issues, side tangents, and just bombard the comment section with irrelevant statements because I don't want you to lose focus. So moderators, you have my permission. If someone is attacking and repeating the same nonsense, he's not here to listen, get rid of him so it won't hinder any one of you. And now my brother Christos Anesti, for the past months, and I love Christos and I give him our time. For the past months, he keeps repeating ad infinitum, ad nauseum, the New World Translation, Hebrews 1, verse 8. And he thinks I haven't seen it the first 10 million times that he's been posting it. And that's ironic because he sees me on Discord. He doesn't bring it up in Discord. He brings it up in the comment section. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with this guy. Dude, seriously. Oh, man, dude. For the past... No, you've been asking that question even from previous sessions. I, I have a memory of an elephant. Even in previous sessions, talking about Joe's Witnesses, you brought up Hebrews 1.8, New World Translation. You know that, right? You know that you have done that. This wasn't the first time. Man, it may have been the first time after a long time, but you've done it in other sessions, brother. Okay? Hebrews 1.8, New World Translation. Hebrews 1.8, Hebrews 1.8. Hey, Sam, right here. Over here, Sam. Over here. Over here, Sam, it's me, not at Christos, man. Even though I see on Discord every day, I don't care to bring it up then. I'm going to bring it up here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. No, Mohammed Sheikh, babies do not go to hell, my friend. They're under the grace of the triune God, under the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the saving benefits of the Lord Jesus are applied to them in the infinite love, compassion, mercy of our God. But yeah, I've, you know, uh, Christos will get there. Now, guys, before you ask me questions, listen, I'm going to begin in prayer. I'm going to begin in prayer. But before you ask me questions, thank you, S. Draper. I usually don't smile much because, no, nah, I'm not going to. As Draper, are you a brother or a sister? Are you a brother or a sister? Because I'm going to begin in prayer, and there's one question I'm going to answer. Then I'm going to open up the floors to your questions, and you can comment on Skype. But wait, let me finish the question. Thank you, Magnum. Thank you, sister, my Nubian princess. Oh, yeah, big Sofo, to answer your question, you haven't followed my channel long enough. I actually love the Orthodox Church, and I love my brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ who are Orthodox. I'm at a position in my life. I've reached a position in my life. Cameron, don't, don't Skype me now. You're going to get blocked if you Skype me now. Wait and be patient. I'm at a position in my life where I believe there are true believers, true believers born of the Spirit in every major branch of Christianity, every major church that's Trinitarian, okay? So I believe there are Orthodox, Catholic, and I'm, I know Orthodox, Catholic are going to disagree with me. I believe there are Coptics who may be Miophysites. I believe there are Syrians from the Syrian Church of the East and Protestants who are saved, born of the Spirit, and are my brothers, sisters in Christ. And I also believe there are false Christians in all of these major branches of Christianity. You got jerks, you got wolves in Protestant churches, you got jerks, you got wolves in <clears throat> Catholic churches, in Orthodox churches, in the Assyrian Church of the East, because Satan doesn't discriminate. His children are scattered everywhere to try to destroy the unity of true believers born of the Spirit who worship the triune God. 
And folks, believe it or not, you got diehard Catholics. And one of my favorite diehard Catholics is Michael Voris, church militant. The guy's passionate for what he believes. And you have diehard Catholics that don't like the Pope. They think the Pope, this Pope here is a disgrace and a humiliation. And you have diehard Catholics who are upset even when Pope John Paul kissed the Quran. I'll give you an example. And I, he's one of my mods, and I made him a mod because I believe this sincerely about him. Okay? Ariel Gonzalez is a young man who I see becoming a great apologist for the glory of Jesus Christ. I believe that. And I pray God will confirm that in his, in his, in his life because we want more apologists. He loves the Lord, and he's a Catholic. And he'll tell you, this Pope, problems. And he'll tell you, yes, when the Pope kissed the crown, that was wrong. Okay? Yep. Oh, yeah. And you got another one, Pope Honorius, who was condemned by all the subsequent popes after him. <laughs> oh, poor, poor Honorius. Poor, poor Honorius. That's my position. Okay, so that's one of my position. But you know what? Can I can I be honest with you? My opinion means nothing. You know why? I'm not God. I'm not the judge. Even if I think you're not a Christian, do you think God cares what I think? God forbid I may be a false Christian. I may go to hell. In fact, if you ask, don't convert to Islam, I'm evil. He's evil, and I got to expose him. All right. Really, honestly. That's why when people ask me these questions, before I begin, because I want to remind you, when people ask me these questions, it's as if I'm some sort of authority, and I got revelation from God that I can say, oh, yeah, my friend. Guys, at the end of the day, just listen, hear me out here. I want you to hear me out. At the end of the day, I may be self-deceived. I may be self-delusional. I may think I'm a Christian. But at the end of the day, I may be one of those who has deceived himself into thinking he's a Christian. And God forbid, I may be accursed and I'll be condemned by Jesus. I don't want that to happen, and I don't believe I'm a false Christian. But you know what? Matthew 7, 21, 23 is there in the Bible, and it doesn't discriminate. Matthew 7, 21, 23 is there in the Bible. It doesn't discriminate. Let's, let's read that passage so I can pray and then answer a question for a precious sister, Louisa. Thank Riaz. Here, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful work, works. Now notice 23. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Did you catch it? Guys, did you catch it? Jesus says on that day, the day of judgment, there will be people who think they're Christians. Will approach them and saying, Lord, Lord. Meaning they believed I was their Lord. And go, Lord, look at me. I preached the gospel. I did miracles in your name. And I cast out demons in your name. And Jesus says, that still doesn't mean you belong to me and that I knew you and we had a relationship with each other and we were in fellowship with each other. Depart from me into hell, you workers of iniquity. Hey, Acts 17 Apologetics, my back gave up from carrying you, bro. I don't think I can carry you anymore. I'm in a wheelchair carrying all that dead weight. Brother, you're going to have to start carrying your own weight, so start jogging. Anyway, Hater Woods here. Okay, what's my point there, folks? Yeah, guys, send me your 900 viewers that always fall asleep when they listen to you live because you're the greatest cure to insomnia. And don't forget, Renee, I'm a ninth-degree black belt in Take Your Dough and the Grandmaster of Take One To Go. Jumbi, Jikiriki, Ana. All right. Now, remember what I just read? Matthew 7, 21, 23, folks. Matthew 7, 21, 23. Jesus says there will be Christians who are self-deceived. Are you listening? Ultimate heavy hitter. You're a Muslim who attacks Christians. Do you care? Do you care? And you're back? You're one of those guys I shouldn't have unblocked. Okay, anyway. Folks, pay attention. Matthew 7, 21, 23 says, there are Christians who are self-deceived. They think they're Christians, they're not. 
So how do you know whether you're a Christian or not? Do you want the answer? Jesus gave it in Matthew 7, 23. Jesus gave the answer. How do you know you're a Christian or not? You may claim to be a Christian. You say you love Jesus, but you want the answer? Who wants the answer? How do I then know I'm not deceived? The answer is there in 23. He says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. The word iniquity, those of you who read Greek, have an advantage. It's anomian. You know what it means? Depart from me, you lawless ones. Here he gave the clue. Depart from me, you lawless ones. Meaning, these so-called Christians had no regard for my commands, had no regard for my word, did not try to obey my commands and live them by the power of the Holy Spirit for my glory. They were lip service. They preached, they did miracles, but they did not obey my commands. And let me show you what Jesus says about those who do not obey his law. John 14, 23 to 24. John 14, verses 23 to 24. So folks, at the end of the day, I thank the Lord Jesus for your love for me and your graciousness towards me. And thank you for your support, you Super Chatter Show. But I am not, and I say this in all honesty, I am not an authority for you to look to and to care what I have to say. Care what the Bible says. And as long as I interpret the Bible correctly by the power of the Holy Spirit, then accept what the Bible says. Who cares about my opinion? Here, now here, read with me. Thank Rias for helping me, John 14, 23, 24. Here's the test for you and me to see if we love Jesus. Guys, pay attention. This is the Lord Jesus speaking. These are the words of the Lord, John 14, 23, 24. Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, see, if a man love me, here's how you know you love me. He will keep my words and my father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings. This is how you know you love me. You will strive by the part of the Spirit to keep my words. If you don't keep my sayings, that means you don't love me, no matter how much you say you do. And the word which he hears not mine, but the Father's which sent me. Did you guys catch it? John 14, verse 24. Amen, Jimmy. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. So that's that's this key. So, folks, pray for each other. Pray for me that we truly are born of the Spirit. We truly belong to Jesus and that we truly love him by striving to obey his words in the power of the Holy Spirit. Pray for one another. Pray for me. Holy Spirit, empower us to live in obedience to the commands of Christ and not to pay lip service. Please, Holy Spirit. Okay? Just keep that in mind. Now let's begin in prayer. Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Please destroy distractions of Satan and his children. Give me the power to exercise perfect self-constraint. Crucify my flesh. Mortify my flesh. Destroy my sinful passions. All of us. Please, Father. Please, Lord Jesus. Please, Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, empower us to know the word, to obey the word, to love the word, to proclaim the word and die for the word. For your word is truth. The word of the Father revealed in Jesus and preserved by your power, Holy Spirit, in the scriptures you produce through holy men of God. Give us the grace to obey it. Anoint me, Holy Spirit, to recall the passages and interpret them correctly without error, without stammering, without confusion. And anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants, Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, shield us from the sons of Satan who want to slander us, protect us. And do not allow us to fail the Lord Jesus and shame the Lord Jesus or blaspheme the, the name of the Lord Jesus. But give us power to overcome the flesh and Satan and sin and to live for Jesus. Holy Spirit, be with us. Be with this session, please. And bring them, those that you want them to hear from you. As you anoint me to speak your words without error for the glory of Jesus. Save me from stammering and confusion. And fill my lungs and my chest and throat with health, with the breath of life. Life from you, Holy Spirit, and bless everyone and illuminate them to understand, to understand, please, your word and give us the power to live it. Because we need you and depend on you and trust in you and love you, Holy Spirit. You are the eternal spirit of the Father and the Son, 
sent to guide us and sanctify us. So we entrust our lives to you, the lives of our families, my daughters to you, Holy Spirit. We love you and we worship you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' almighty name, Yehovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and perfect my sight spiritually and physically. In Jesus' name. All right. Let me just get something to drink. There's one question I'm going to answer first. Okay. Someone told me you should smile more because you have a contagious smile. You know, one, one sister told me my first block. Basarat, my first block. You know why? Because this gentleman was a Muslim. He said, CP is a donkey. He confused CP with his prophet and his mother. One sister told me that my eyes smile, that when I people look at my eyes, it looks like my eyes are smiling. Smile. I just got to get some to drink. We're going to begin. Okay. My Nubian princess, the more you tell me smile, the more you make my heart melt. Smile, though your heart is breaking. Smile, though your heart is aching. Did you know Michael Jackson's favorite song was Smile? My favorite version of that song is by Nat King Cole. It's called Smile. You know who wrote that song? Charlie Chaplin. Charlie Chaplin wrote that song. Oh, why? Magdalene, my Nubian princess, are you saying it turns you off? Or is it tempting women? My sisters, when I do this, is it tempting you? Because if it is, I'll stop. I don't want to be a stumbling block. See? Here you go. Smile. Oh, your heart is aching. Smile. All right. Pray that the Spirit fills us. Let me get something to drink. Hold on. Walla makan. I don't know the words of that Arabic song. I just make up the words as I go along. Walla mania. Walla mania. Walla mania. ding ding. By the way, how's the sound? Someone is telling me the sound quality is not good, but it's a Mac. So this is the best I have. So I hope the sound is still good. You know it, Sam? What do you know, brother? Thank you, Ariel. Remember, write that. Sahi El Shamuni. The not-for-profit Shamun said, I do not want my chest jingling to cause sisters to stumble. I'm talking about not my voice. Not my voice, guys. I'm talking about the sound quality. Someone was complaining. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for the super chat. All right. All right. Now, I'm going to answer this question. Folks, let me answer this question. When I finish, I'm going to open the floor to other questions. I promise you. This is your time, but I'm going to answer this question. Because it keeps coming up, I already did a multi-part series on communion of saints. I'm going to now just, again, briefly touch on it. Okay. But please help me to help you by focusing. And the only way you're going to get a block here, if you justify abortion, which is murder of unborn children, if you justify it, you got to go. If you blaspheme the Trinity, if you blaspheme the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you got to go. Now, mods, you have my permission and authority. Use your discretion. If someone's here and is distracting you or others from listening, get rid of them. That's You have my authority to... Use your discretion. But as far as I'm concerned, you want to attack me, mock me, I'm going to ignore that now. Now, let me explain and the issue of communion states. <clears throat> okay. People... See, again, when you pray, folks... Let me let you in a secret. Be careful what you pray for. Let me tell you why. When you pray for patience, guess what God's going to do? Send people, allow people to test your patience because it's easy to be patient when you're not tested, right? But how do you know that you are patient by the power of the Holy Spirit and you're being sanctified? 
when people attack you and attack you and you just constrain yourself by the part of the Spirit and smile. Smile, though your heart is breaking. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Ultimate heavy hitter, can I ask you an honest question? Do you have a life? Do you have a life? Because you stock every Christian YouTube channel and live stream under the sun. Do you have a life or you have no existence, no value? And I'm being honest. Were you neglected as a child? Did your father abuse you? Did your mother tell you that you're a mistake? And so you're angry at life and you hate the world, so you want to punish Christians? Okay, now let's focus. Basarat, I'll tell you when to call me. Just let me answer this question. People keep telling me, you know, they have a hard time praying to Mary or the saints. Okay, folks, let me walk you through this. And let me repeat. Can you follow me and give me your ear so you can learn? Basarat, I'll tell you when you can call me, sister. I mean, I can tell you when you call me, but don't call me sister. When I said I can tell you when you call me sister, don't call me sister. I'm not your sister, but I'll tell you when you can call me. Now that's it. All right. F focus with me. Let me help you walk, walk through this. It took me over 10 years. It took me. Thank you, Nina. God bless you. Jared. It took me over 10 years to finally come to the conclusion that this teaching called communion of saints intercession of the saints is based on scripture it is biblical over 10 years and i want luisa my sister to hear me over 10 years of wrestling and struggling and agonizing and you know <clears throat> going back and forth until finally i believe i came to the point that i no longer had any good reasons for rejecting it because there's ample scriptural basis for it and i just submitted okay now that's my journey that's me if you don't accept it and if you have a problem with it fine i'm not telling you you can ask the saints to pray for you who are in heaven that's fine put it aside just keep seeking the face of the holy spirit keep yielding to the holy spirit but one thing i'm going to ask every one of you not to do because i used to do it just because you may not accept it or you may have a hard time with it. Don't assume that this doctrine is something that it's not. Now, please understand what I'm about to say. There, there are people. Guys, don't let ultimate deceiver dis, uh, distract you because that's the devil. Focus. There are people who have abused this teaching of the communion of saints. Yes, there are people who end up saying too much about the saints. Too much even of the blessed mother of our Lord. And... Idolize them and turn it into an idolatrous practice. That's a given because human sinners will take a sound teaching and they will corrupt it. They will abuse it. They will misuse it and they will take it to the extreme. You'll even have Orthodox. You'll even have Catholics and Assyrian church members who will admit this. Here, Harry, look. Look what Harry just said. Indeed, there are abuses of many doctrines. Okay. So there are people who've taken it to extreme and are sinning and may God convict them to repent. But let me now explain. For those who properly understand the doctrine and know the limits of quote-unquote veneration, you cannot assume and condemn them for being idolatrous or committing idolatry just because you don't believe it or you don't see its biblical basis. So again, let me repeat, you don't want to believe this doctrine? That's between God. I'm not here to make, I'm talking about my journey, and I'm trying to avoid having to correct misunderstandings or misapplication of biblical verses to show that this doctrine is not biblical. Okay, now with that said, let me deal with one major objection. You shouldn't be praying to the saints, you are to pray to God alone. Okay, now work with me, guys. Yeah, work with me. When you say pray, how are you defining the term prayer? Do you mean worship? Yes, you are not to worship any glorified believer who's now resting in the heavenly presence of Christ. But the problem is prayer is not just worship. Hear me out, guys. 
Biblically, prayer can also mean asking, invoking, asking God, invoking God. Now, if you define prayer as asking, then when I ask you to pray for me, that would be a type of prayer. You get what I'm saying? But no one would accuse me of committing idolatry for asking a fellow Christian to pray for me. So prayer doesn't necessarily mean worship. That's what I want you to see. So please, just hear me out. Prayer doesn't necessarily mean worship. It can mean asking. Now, you'll say, yeah, you can ask one another on earth, but those in heaven, they're dead to us. We're dead to them. We don't ask. Okay, that's fine. Put that aside. But understand what I'm trying to get at. Prayer doesn't always mean worship. It can mean asking or invoking. Secondly, no informed Christian who believes in communion of saints. Listen to me, guys. No informed Christian who believes in communion of saints believes that the saints answers prayer. Louisa, my sister, I want you to hear this too. No informed Christian who believes in communion of saints believes that they answer prayers. What they believe is they ask God to answer your prayers. It's like when you ask me to pray, you're not asking me to answer your prayer. You're asking me to then pray with you to join in praying to God who alone answers prayers. You with me there? You have Catholics here, Orthodox here, Assyrian church members here. They'll tell you if I'm wrong. There is no one who knows what this doctrine is and is biblically literate and spiritually mature that will tell you the saints answers our prayers. No one who knows what they're talking about will say that. They don't. They'll say we're asking them to join us in asking God who alone answers prayers. Okay, everyone with me so far? Now, Jesus doesn't simply ask for us. Jesus answers prayers because he's almighty God. See, the difference is saints do not know our hearts. God alone does. And because Jesus is God, he knows what's in the hearts of every creature, and he answers prayers because he is God. Can I show you the difference? Well, what's the difference asking? Well, then why would Jesus be? Because Jesus answers prayers with the Father and the Spirit. And with the Father and the Spirit, he knows the hearts of all men, something that's not true of any believer even in heaven. You with me there? Ultimate heavy hitter, you're not asking to know. You're not asking to be sincere. Okay, so stop asking, brother. Don't waste my time, please. Don't waste my time. Okay, now let me show you the difference. Jesus answers prayers because he's God and he knows the hearts of all. John 14, verses 13 and 14. No, it's not, uh, it's not contacting the dead. If you go read the historical context of what contacting the dead is, it has nothing to do with communion of saints. It's as a pagan practice where you conjure up the spirits of the dead to then speak in and through you. Channeling the spirits of the dead. Okay, John 14, 13 and 14. Read with me, guys. Pay attention. Let me finish this question. And then we'll go into other questions. Just be patient. Please help me to help you be patient. John 14, 13 and 14. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do. That will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Did you catch it? Thank you, Sean. Jesus says... I will do what you ask. I will answer your prayers with the Father and the Spirit because he's God, one with the Father and the Spirit. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians 2, 10 to 12. I've said, don't let him, guys, don't fall for ultimate haters' track, uh, uh, tricks. He's trying to distract you to focus on him so you don't listen. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 to 12. But God hath revealed them unto us by the Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Now watch here, 11 and 12. Watch here. 
For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Notice, only you, your inner man, only you know what you're thinking inside along with God. God and you, only God and you know what you're thinking inside internally, right? Okay, so even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Now, guys, you got to pay attention. Pay attention. The Bible says God and you are the only ones who know what you're thinking within you. See, now when you're having conversation internally, your inner man, you know what you're saying to yourself internally. The only other one who knows is God. God and you, right? Okay. Let's go to 1 Kings 8.39. Follow with me. Notice Roy Dean's objection. See, this is where I get tempted to block people. Because he assumes that if they're in heaven, they are not alive and they're not aware of your prayers on earth. Roy, if you're patient, I'm going to refute your pathetic objection, your silly objection. Just be patient. Be patient. I'll school you in a minute, son. With pleasure. First Kings 8.39. Notice Solomon's prayer. Then hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place and forgive and do and give to every man according to his ways, whose heart thou knowest, for thou, you, even thou, you alone only knowest the hearts of all the children of men. Did you catch it? Only God knows the thoughts, the desires of all human beings. Now let's see what Jesus says in Revelation 2.23. Revelation 2.23. Jermaine, you know I'm going to refute your point if you just be patient, right? Jermaine text, your arguments are pathetic. If you wait, I know your arguments because I argue that way. I'm going to refute you guys from Scripture if you be patient. Revelation 2.23. Jesus speaking, guys. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your <clears throat> works. Did you see what Jesus said? I am the one. Who searches the reins and the hearts, your minds and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. See, Jesus must be God to have this ability. Because no one believes that any saint knows the hearts of people, their desires, their inclinations, and answers prayers and repay people for what they've done. Only God and God alone. And Jesus claims what only God can claim. And therefore, he must be omniscient, omnipotent. Omnipresent, right? Okay. So you understand the difference now. Jesus is God, which is why he answers prayers and knows the hearts of every creature. The saints in heaven do not answer prayers. They join us in asking God to answer our prayers, and they don't know the hearts of everyone. But, ah, now wait. Now are you ready now? For me to refute these objections that the people are saying, yeah, but I'm alive here and you're alive and you know it. Okay, are you ready now? I'm now going to show you that God, who alone is omniscient, can reveal. Pay attention now. God, who alone is omniscient, can reveal to saints in heaven, even on earth, even on earth, hidden Thoughts, desires, inclinations, and actions of people. So you don't have to be omniscient to know what's taking place. All you need is an omniscient God to tell you what's taking place. Do you understand the difference? Can I now prove it to you? Are you ready to listen to this? Because I don't want to keep answering this objection. Okay, let me repeat it again. You don't need to be omniscient. To know what someone is saying or doing, all you need is an omniscient God to reveal it to you, saying, hey, this person, that person, this is what they're doing, this is what they're saying. Now, are you ready for the proof of that? Are you ready for the proof? Okay, Revelation 5.13. The proof that God can make known to a creature who's not omniscient the things that are taking place. Here, let me prove it to you. Revelation 5.13. Here you go. Nope. 
Post it again, friend, because it posted in reverse order. Revelation 5.13. Mario, it's like saying, is it necessary to ask your brothers and sisters in church to pray for you? You answer the question. Is it necessary, Mario, to ask your mother or your father or your brother in Christ to pray for you? Okay. Now, guys, pay attention. Please pay attention. And every creature which is in heaven. Guys, notice John, who's a creature. He sees himself as well in this, in this group. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and underneath the earth and such are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Question. Guys, here's my question. Please answer. Help me to help you. Are you ready? Question. Gideon, I've already answered these, brother. Brother, do you know I've already went through all this? Been there, done that, got the t-shirt, Gideon? Can you go to my series on Communion Saints and see how I address those issues? Okay. Now, can you help me answer this question? How did John hear and see every creature in all of creation? Because Revelation 5.13. And I heard every creature in heaven, on earth, beneath the earth, in the seas, and all things in them. How was John able to see every created thing and hear what they were saying? When creatures on earth speak different languages, how did John see and hear all that and know what they're all saying? Can you answer that question for me? Post Revelation 5.13 again. Revelation 5.13 again. It's your Bible, folks. My Bible, the Word of God. Let God tell you what God can and cannot do. Okay, here. And every creature, not some, which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, heard I, I heard them saying. So do you now agree that God, who is omniscient, can allow a creature by removing the veil to behold creation and understand what creatures are saying in the various languages, because though they're speaking different languages, the spirit will make their language one to his ears without that creature being omniscient. You understand what I'm saying? So don't misquote me. Please do not misquote me. I'm not saying this is a proof text for communion of saints. That's not what I'm using it for. Okay, listen to me. I'm not using this as a proof text for communion of saints. I'm using this to show your objection, which was my objection, that creatures in heaven can't know who's asking them to pray because they're not omniscient. That is a pathetic, pathetic objection. Because a creature in heaven doesn't have to be omniscient. The omniscient God can make it known to that creature in heaven. Just like the omniscient God made it known to Peter on earth that Ananias and Sapphira lied to them and held back part of the money from the property they sold. See, Peter didn't have to know and be omniscient. The omniscient God revealed it to Peter. Ananias just sold the property and he's holding back some of the money and he's going to lie to you, giving you the impression that he's giving you all the proceeds when he kept some back to himself. Expose him, Peter. So you do not need to be omniscient. All you need is an omniscient God to reveal it to you. Acts 5, verses 1 to 4. Acts 5, verses 1 to 4. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession... Read with me. And kept part, kept back part of the price. He kept back part of the money. His wife also being privy to it. She was also in cahoots with him and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, and to keep back part of the price of the land? Right? Now notice four. Okay. 
Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? Was it yours? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? You could do what you want with it? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou is not light unto men, but unto God. Now, how did Peter know, who's not omniscient, um, he's not omnipresent. How did P Peter know, and Ananias and his wife lied to them because they kept back a part of the money, but tried to deceive them to thinking, here, we're giving you the full proceed. How did he know? How did he know? Yes, the Holy Spirit. So you're telling me the Holy Spirit can't reveal to someone in heaven what's taking place on earth. Well, you'd be wrong because I just showed you Revelation 5.13. John sees every creature and hears every creature, every human creature. And he hears all of them in their different languages speaking in the same language to his ears without having to be omniscient. Right? So can we stop with these silly objections? Okay, now let me give you another one. Revelation 8, verses 3 to 5. Revelation 8, 3 to 5. I don't care what you think, Max. I don't care what you think. It's what you can prove. And now I'm going to show you wrong again, Max. Because here, Revelation 8, 3 to 5. Pay attention. Okay, who's going to post, Protestant or Riaz? Protestant, you want to do it or you want Riaz to do it? Let's see. Which one of you guys want to do it so we can stick with one? Let's see. So let's okay. Protestant will thank you, Ross. You're, you're, it's not your second best, Riaz. Your third best. So, okay, I'm sorry, Max. I thought you were disagreeing because the way you worded it, I apologize, Max. Protestant post Revelation 8, 3 to 5, verses 3 to 5. Revelation 8, verse 3 to 5. So I'm going to answer this quickly. I'm going to move on to other questions. And I don't want to keep talking about this. I've already done multi-part series. You disagree with me? That's okay. That's between you and the Lord. Revelation 8, verse 3 to 5. Answer this question for me. I don't know where your deceased father is, Roy. If he's alive in the presence of Christ, ask him to pray for you. If you think he's not a believer, then don't waste your time. But I know Mary's in heaven. She's glorified with Christ. And Paul and Peter are in heaven. They're glorified in Christ. Because if they didn't make it to heaven, you're, you're definitely not going to make it. So I have a better chance of asking someone that I know is in heaven. I know the mother of my Lord is in heaven. I know Peter's in heaven. Because if they're not in heaven, you ain't going to heaven, buddy. About whether your dad is there or not, I don't know. I'm not God. Okay, Revelation 8, 3 to 5. And another, pay attention, guys. Revelation 8, verse 3 and 5. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayer of all saints. Oh, what are you doing, John? What in the world is an angel doing offering the prayers of saints? Upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there was voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Hmm. Post-Revelation 8, verses 3 and 4 again. Revelation 8, verses 3 and 4 again. Okay. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it. He should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. Why are you offering the prayers of the saints, Mr. Angel? Only one mediator, Jesus Christ. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. Out of the angel's hand. So now you guys who keep attacking this doctrine, I want you to explain to me, why is an angel in heaven mediating the prayers of saints to God? He's offering the prayers with incense. That's mediation. He's mediating your worship to God. Yes, you can ask angels, Stephen. Of course you can. Of course you can. 
Can someone answer that for me? Please answer. Give me your best shot. Why is an angel offering incense on the altar, which is an act of sacrifice and worship, and the prayers of saints? Why is he mediating? It says he offered the prayers of the saints. Why is he doing that? And angels don't dare to help you, Remy. But faith, why are they taking the prayers of the saints to God? Okay. Revelation 5.8, which someone keep bringing up. So someone just insulted God, the Father. Remember what I said about blasphemous pigs? If they insult God, get rid of them. Trump's life. Revelation 5, 8. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and 24 elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. Wait, wait, wait. What did the 24 elders and the four living creatures have? Golden vials. That were odors which symbolized the prayers of the saints. The prayers of the saints were in their hands. In their hands. Mike, you still don't get it, right? Mike, don't attack Strawman, Mike AD. Please, please don't attack Strawman. You're not answering the question. I didn't say that they're praying to the angels here. You're not answering the question, and you're not going to get far if you don't answer the question, brother. What in the world are they doing offering your prayers to God? Whether you're asking them to pray or not, you still didn't answer the point. Why are they between you and God? And why are they bringing your prayers to God? That is what a mediator does. That's what a mediator does. He mediates your offering to God. Why? You're not answering the question, Mike. You can try to tap dance. And I know you mean well. I'm not saying this, but you know. Ah, but it doesn't say praying... Did I say that's what it says? Get the point. The point is you have biblical verses where angels are bringing your prayers to God. That means they're acting as mediators where they mediate your prayers to God. Why? And why are they given that responsibility? And if they're given that responsibility to take your prayers to God, you're telling me they don't know what your prayers are? Okay, let's use the logic. The angel has the prayers of the saints. Oh, he has prayers, but he doesn't know these are prayers of the saints because he's not omniscient. Really? So that means the angels are aware of your prayers on earth. They have to be aware of your prayers for them then to carry it to God. You still don't get it? Everyone in heaven has a role to play. Some, some have higher roles than others. If you go back, Blatina... I already covered this. Not everyone in heaven has the same rank. Some are higher ranking than others. Not only they can't see you, they're also bringing your prayers to God. You get my point? Here's another one, Matthew 18, 10. And we're going to end it here. I'm going to move on to other things. No, Sarah, they don't. Sarah Kako, my sister, my certain sister. No, they don't. Angels do not rank higher than saints. Angels are the servants of the members of the body of Christ. Hebrews 1.14. Angels are less than the saints of God. Angel, when I say saints, I'm talking about human beings glorified with Christ, because even angels are saints. Angels, according to Hebrews 1.14 are subject to redeemed human believers who are purchased by the blood of Christ and are members of his body, the church. Human believers are higher than angels. Hebrews 1.14. Uh, Matthew 4.4, 4, I have another problem. Matthew 4.4, 4, can you help me? Hold on, hold on, I'm going to play this guy's game. He thinks he's slick. Matthew 4.4, 4, are you there? Let me play your game. Let me stoop to your level. To show you why you shouldn't speak on issues that really you have no business speaking about. Been there, done that. Okay. Matthew 4.4. 4. Do you worship the Holy Spirit? I'm, I'm assuming you're a Trinitarian. You may be a heretic, so then I'm wasting my time. Matthew 4.4. 4. Do you worship the Holy Spirit? Wait. 
Hold on, let's see this. Do you worship the Holy Spirit? The guy thought he slick with that comment. Watch. Hold on, guys. Matthew 4, 4, before the rapture, please. If you ignore me, you're going to have to be ignored. Come on, man. People are waiting. We don't want to wait all day because this is relevant to the topic. That's why I stopped to, to entertain you. Guys, it's relevant to the topic. He goes, I don't find anywhere in Scripture where it says pray to the saints. Okay. Matthew 4, 4. Do you worship the Holy Spirit? Okay, Matthew 4, 4. Answer the question. You're going to get your answer. Do you worship the Holy Spirit? Now, I don't see a single verse in the Bible saying worship the Holy Spirit. So why do you? Can you quote a verse where it says worship the Holy Spirit? Matthew 4, 4. Why are you worshiping the Holy Spirit when there is no verse says to worship him? You see what you just did, right? You see what you just did? You just present an argument that can be turned against you to destroy what you believe. We know that we are supposed to worship the Holy Spirit because of what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit being God. Even though we do not have a verse saying worship him. Snow Leopard, you just proved my point, Snow Leopard. You don't need an explicit statement telling you to worship the Holy Spirit because the Bible tells us that he's God and the Bible is sufficient to show us that we should worship him even though it doesn't come out to say worship him. So don't use these arguments. Just because you may not find something explicit that saints pray for you, you ask them, doesn't mean it's not valid. Okay? Now, two more references so we can begin. Matthew 18.10. Matthew 18.10. How are you doing? And then we're going to move on to other questions. Matthew 18.10. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones. For I send to you that in heaven, in heaven, their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. Post it one more time. Matthew 18.10. Can any pr prospect, are you upset about that, brother? Can any prospect, are you upset the length of how, of my answering a question? Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. Okay, now, question. Jesus is warning people on earth. Don't cause these children to stumble and don't cause spiritual babes to stumble. Why? Because I'm telling you, in heaven, their angels that are assigned to them, behold the face of my Father. What is Jesus saying here? There are angels in heaven assigned to pray and intercede for children and their protection. Did you catch it? Matthew 18, 10. It's right there. And he says, don't mess with them because their angels behold the face of my Father. Can I ask you a question? How can angels in heaven? know what's taking place to children on earth and then how can they pray to the father to arise on their behalf if they're being oppressed and abused if they do not know what's taking place on earth okay now folks this should whet your appetite I did a multi-part series, multi-part series on communion of saints. Now, Edric either is not listening because Revelation 8, 3 to 5, it's an angel taking the prayers to the altar and offering it to God. So I answered these concerns. Go and listen to the multi-part series. Please do not ask me the question anymore. In fact, if you want, go to the YouTube channels where you have Orthodox, Catholic, Coptic, Syrian Church of the East, they have sessions that address this topic, provide the biblical evidence for it, and respond to objections better than I could. Better than I could. But I want to leave you with one thing. I'm going to leave you with this, and we're going to open up the Q&A. And it wasn't 60 minutes on one question. Go time yourself. When I started, we were talking about other issues. But this is an important question, and I want to answer it. Now, let me leave you with this. Guys, we found a scrap of a papyrus called the Rylands Papyrus Number 470. Please pay attention. 
We found a papyrus, a scrap called the Ryland's Papyrus number 470. Okay, are you with me here? Are you listening? Are you listening? Some date this. Some date this to around 250 AD. Others would date it a little later in the 300s. Still, it's ancient. Around 250 AD, 3rd century, maybe in the 300s, 4th century. Let me read to you part of that scrap. It's, it's written by a Christian. Are you ready? It's written by a Christian. The Rylands Papyrus, number 470. Guys, pay attention. This is what they found. It's, it's as early as 250 AD, maybe a little later. It's still 3rd, 4th century. This is what it says. Mother of God, Theotokos, hear my supplications. Suffer us not to be in adversity, but deliver us from danger, thou alone, and it ends. Because it's cut off. It's not complete. Okay? Let me, let me post the words again. Here it is. Here it is. Mother of God, Greek, Theotokos. Calling her Theotokos, Mother of God. Hear my supplications. Hear my request to you. Suffer us not to be in adversity, but deliver us from danger, thou alone, and it ends. Can you explain to me why are Christians so early on invoking the mother of Christ to pray for them? Why? And this was widespread. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Papyrus is a reed that they used to write on, Orthochristos. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. It was widespread. But let me give you other examples of people praying. Tell me what you think of these prayers, okay? Other examples of people praying. Okay, I'm going to read them. Please tell me what you think. It becomes, it becomes you to be mindful of us as you stand near him who granted you all graces. For you are the mother of God and our queen. You are the mother of God and our queen. Help us for the sake of the king, the Lord God master who was born of you. For this reason you are called full of grace. What do you think of that prayer? What do you think of that prayer? At St. Athanasius. St. Athanasius prayed that prayer to Mary. St. Athanasius in the year 373. I know you just condemned Athanasius because, Inky, you know more than Athanasius. You're more spiritual, holier, and more intelligent than Athanasius, the great defender of the Trinity, who was almost killed for his faith. Thank you, Inky. I hope I don't stand before your judgment seat. Okay. It becomes you to be mindful of us as you stand near him who granted you all graces, for you are the mother of God and our queen. Wow, Athanasius. Even James White praises you of being one of the greatest Trinitarian defenders. Help us for the sake of the king, the Lord God Master, who was born of you. For this reason, you are called full of grace. Okay, but wait, let me let me read some more prayers for you guys. Hopefully, after this, I won't have to address this. Okay, here's another one. Here's another one, folks. Mary, you are the vessel and tabernacle containing all mysteries. You know what the patriarchs never knew. You have experienced what was never revealed to the angels. You have heard what the prophets never heard. In a word, all that was hidden from preceding generations was made known to you even more. Most of these wonders depended on you. You know what that was? St. Gregory, and I can't pronounce his name, Thal Maturgis in the year 270. St. Gregory, Thal Maturgis in the year 270. Are you noticing? 250, 270, 373. You're seeing this is a pattern in all the centuries where Christians in different places, in different areas, and what do you find in common? No hesitation to ask the mother of Christ to pray for them.
Okay, and let me give you a final one. For you Assyrians, Assyrians, you're going to love this one, Assyrian. Guys, I'm going to read it slowly. Please pay attention. If you're Assyrian, you should love this. Blessed virgin, immaculate and pure. Blessed virgin, immaculate and pure. You are the sinless mother of your son, who is the mighty Lord of the universe. Since you are holy and inviolate, the hope of the hopeless and sinful. I sing your praises. I praise you as full of every grace. For you bore the God-man. That's why I'm praising you, because you bore the God-man. I venerate you. I invoke you and implore your aid. Holy and immaculate virgin, help me in every need that presses upon me and free me from all the temptations of the devil. Be my intercessor and advocate at the hour of death and judgment. Deliver me from the fire that is not extinguished and from the outer darkness. Make me worthy of the glory of your son. I know these prayers are going to be hard for some of you, but if you don't understand their theological context, you're going to think what's going on here. But, oh, dearest and most kind virgin mother, you indeed are my most secure and only hope, for you are holy in the sight of God, to whom be honor and glory. To God be honor and glory, majesty and power forever. Amen. You know what this was? Folks, Assyrians, this is one of our Assyrian saints. Saint Ephraim, Ephraim, Suraya. Prayer of Saint Ephraim. Who lived around 306, 373 A.D. Eprim Suraya, an Assyrian. Eprim Suraya, an Assyrian saint, a believer of Jesus Christ. Folks, here's my challenge to you. Here's what I'm going to challenge you to do. Okay. I want you to find a statement in the early church condemning the invocation of the, the mother of Christ. You won't find it. It was widespread and accepted. Even when the church is split, the Syrian church split, the Miaphysite church is split, right? Even when they split in the 5th century, in the 6th century, they still held this in common, the invocation of the mother of Christ and the saints in heaven, because it was ancient and early, and you will not find you will not find, you will not find a descending voice from those who represented orthodoxy. Okay? So, folks, if you think this is idolatrous, blasphemous, okay, that's between you and God. But you know what you're saying? You know what you're saying? I'm going to be honest with you. You know what you're saying? You're saying that people like Athanasius or St. Gregory Ephraim, they were idolaters, blasphemers. But these are the men representing the church, defending the church of Christ <clears throat> against heretics and schismatics who died as martyrs. So if they're wrong, you have no church, folks. You end up being a Jehovah Witness or a Mormon who thinks that by the second century, the church of Christ was lost and there was some remnant out there hidden. And then Christ had to rediscover his church. Yes, no, you can. Okay, is that clear? Now, I hope I answered this question. Folks, don't ask me this question again. I have a multi-part series. And guys, again, I'm going to repeat. You think I'm wrong? That's okay. You can think I'm wrong. And by the way, what I just told you, let me repeat it as God is listening. He knows my heart better than me, and may he save me from myself for the glory of Christ. I am not saying this as a Roman Catholic or an Orthodox. I'm saying this as someone who believes in the Bible and still holds to sola scriptura, sola fide, two doctrines that the Orthodox don't accept, the Catholics don't accept, and the Syrian Church of the East doesn't accept. So don't say, ah, oh, he got Catholic on me. or Earth. No, no. I'm just being honest to the scriptures to the best of my ability. If I'm wrong, Holy Spirit, please save me from error and protect them from my mistakes. But here's my challenge to every one of you. You claim to be following the Bible and not tradition of men. Everyone follows tradition. Even the best of Protestants do. Anyone who tells you doesn't follow a tradition, he's deceived. Here's my challenge to every one of you. Show me any source in the second, third, fourth centuries of the church where those representing the church, not heretics, condemned invoking believers such as the mother of the Lord in heaven to pray for them and seeking their intercession. Show it to me.
You won't find it. Now, let's answer other questions. Basira, feel free to call me. Okay. That's it. I'm done with this question. I'm not going to address it again. I'm going to move on to other things. Okay, Basira, you can ask. Now it's open. Q&A. Hello. How are you, sister? What? Let me just sing with you. Bada bing, bada bing, ding, ding. Okay, go ahead, sister. Good evening, brother. God bless you. Calling bless from you the too. UK. Lord bless you. Um, I'm I'm an ex-Muslim. I came to Christ Hallelujah. over 19 years ago through a dream. Although my mom was a Christian who converted to Islam because of my dad, but then eventually she came back to Christ. Hallelujah. She's now late, but I thank God that she died in the Lord, so I'm quite oh, yeah. happy about that. But my question is, um, raised as a Nigerian, By the way, sister, before you move on, you became a Christian. Sister Basarat, just one second. Mike, I challenge you to quote for Samuel 28, and I challenge you to show me where it says God killed Saul for speaking to Samuel, what the context is, Mike. Please, Mike, brother, don't misquote for Samuel 28. God did not kill Saul for contacting Samuel. God had rejected Saul because he was an unbeliever and he went to a witch to contact the spirit of the dead. How in the world do you connect that with communion of saints? I'm getting very angry with you with your perversion of scripture, Mike A.D. Don't misinterpret scripture like that again in my presence. Go ahead, sister. I'm sorry. I had to correct someone who's perverting the Bible. No, it's okay. It's fine. I'm also learning. So um, as I was saying, so um, growing up, in a predominantly Nigerian church, we're used to using, well, pleading the blood of Jesus on everything. For example, um, if you buy a new car, you plead the blood of Jesus. If you buy a new house, you plead the blood of yeah. Jesus. If you're eating, you plead the blood of Jesus. Yeah. And I was talking to a friend who said to me that if I truly understood what the blood was meant for, I wouldn't just use it for, yeah, for material the, things. Yeah. And it made me feel really bad, but maybe because my understanding hasn't grown to her level, maybe pleading the blood of Jesus on a new car or in the home yeah, or yeah. my children, maybe that's not, it's not necessary. Yeah. But I felt that going from what the example in Exodus where um, God asked the um, the the Jews to put the blood of um, well, the blood of a lamb on their house that when death yeah, passes. Yeah, that was the Passover lamb. That's a different context. Yeah, yeah, that that's oh. a different context. Yeah. Oh, okay. So that was that was one of the reasons why I thought pleading the blood of Jesus no. on a new house on a car shouldn't be bad. But she said no, 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 no. That I should improve my understanding so i wanted to ask you is there anything wrong in me pleading the blood of jesus yeah uh, or yeah you're asking a difficult question to answer because what is your purpose and intention in pleading the blood of christ on your possessions i just i i feel it's a form of covering as in you know if if an if, if a spiritual enemy that I can't see yeah. sees the mark of Christ on my car or on my house, yeah. they know that this is not their territory. That's why I do it. Yeah. But she said the blood is a ransom for our salvation, and it has nothing to do with my house or no. I my think car. yeah, she's she's I going to extreme as you are going to the extreme, sister. I need yeah. I want you to hear this out. She's going to the okay. extreme, and as as many charismatic go to the extreme. The blood is a ransom, but the blood also is what gives us victory over Satan, right? Yes. Revelation 12. If you read Revelation 12, read verse 11. How do you overcome the devil? They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Yes. So it's not just ransoming. It's also our means of victory in overcoming Satan and his yeah. accusations. And also... <clears throat> If you're saying it's the blood of Jesus that shields you from the evil one, that it does, yes, because I'm trying to see, yeah, because it's difficult because you want protection over your children and over your property so that the enemy doesn't harm you 
or even use your property to harm you or cause you to to fall away yeah yeah that's a difficult one you know what in your heart are you convicted that you're doing something wrong no you're not convicted no. you're at peace doing it I, I sorry are you at peace doing it yes i do feel at peace when i okay. do it then go ahead there's nothing in scripture that condemns it but there's nothing explicit that says you should do it so let your conscience be your guide if there was something in scripture that condemned it then i would say you're wrong but since the scripture doesn't explicitly say that's not what you do or tells you that's what you should do because you understand that the blood of Christ is your shield and it's your protection and guard against Satan. And as long yeah. as in your conscience you're not bothered by it because you understand what it is. It's not a magical incantation like some magical formula. But you're simply yeah. asking that the blood of Jesus is your shield, your family shield against the evil one. And you're asking yeah. the Lord to protect you and your children and your possessions because your possessions belong to the Lord. And you're not bothered and convicted in your heart. Go ahead and do it. Keep doing it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, because I Michael. wanted you to understand not everything is black and white in the Bible. This is what I was trying to say earlier. Some things are black and white. Other things are not black and white. So you have to then study what the scriptures teach in context clearly and then arrive at a conclusion. So like I said about the Holy Spirit, we're not told to worship the Holy Spirit. We're not told not to worship the Holy Spirit. So then how do we know? If it's right to worship the spirit or not because we see what the Bible teaches as a whole the Holy Spirit is God And if he's God God is worthy of worship. Therefore the Holy Spirit is worthy of worship. See I made an inference Nothing explicit. Yeah. So that's what you're doing. The blood of Jesus not only ransoms me It shields me from the evil one and it yes. protects me from the evil one and it's my victory against the evil one Therefore, I'm going to plead the blood of Jesus upon my entire household our possessions to be our covering and shield against the evil one, you're all right. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. It actually makes me feel, because she made me feel like yeah. I didn't understand what the blood was for. And no. I thought to myself, I felt, I mean, like I said, I feel at ease within myself that I'm doing this. I feel it's the right thing to do. Amen. As long as your conscience, it that way. sister, I'm not trying to cut you off. I apologize for that. As long as the conscience doesn't convict you that, hey, you may be not doing something wrong. And be careful and be leery of Christians who think they know more than they do. And I pray I'm not one of them. I pray God gives me the grace not to think I'm more knowledgeable than I am because I'm human and I can be puffed up. Just ask Mike A.D. who just got puffed up by misquoting 1 Samuel 28, even though I love the brother, but not too much. Be wary of Christians who think they know the Bible more than they do and think that they have the right to correct you. Just because there are statements that say the blood of Christ ransomed you, but the same Bible would say that it's the blood of Christ that gives you victory over Satan. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, Revelation 12, 11. So as long as your conscience doesn't bother you. Okay. Thank you very much. God bless Thank you. you. God, God bless you, God. you too. Keep praying bless and the Lord preserve you. you. Hallelujah. You left Islam for Jesus. May all your family members who don't know Jesus come to know Jesus and protect you for his glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you. God bless. God Bye. Bless you, sister. Take care. Before you guys call me. We got a guy named Car Booster wants to call me. That doesn't look like a kosher name, right? Car booster. And then some guy who claims to be a doctor. Two red flags right there. Before anyone calls me, let me answer Andy Ray's question. Andy Ray, are you there? Andy Ray? Yeah. When someone goes by the name car booster, you know he's trying to carjack you, do a hit and run. And then when someone has doctor in front of his name, you know the horse is kind of high. <laughs> yeah. I'm doctor, sir. I have many, many patients. All right. Andy Ray, are you there? Okay, I'm going to answer your question. Andy Ray asked me a question. John 3.13.
All right. John 3, 13. Sarah Kako, Yat Kotlatlila. Kotlatlia, Surya. Kaliolibak, Surya. Thank you, Vine. God bless you. Pins and needles, needles and pins. I just did a series on that. Yachai, ya chali olibach, chali en shuaribach, en shuaribach chali al achal nane. Go listen to my sessions. John three thirteen, Protestant. Can you post it? Thank you. As if I don't know what that means. Okay, John three thirteen. Yeah, you can call me brother anytime. Just don't call me sister. Okay, let's read John 3.13. Hold on, let me finish this question. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. John 3.13. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Did you catch it? No man has gone up to heaven. Ah, but wait. Enoch went to heaven. Genesis 5, 21, 24. 2 Kings 2. Elijah went to heaven. Okay. Isn't that a contradiction? You understand the issue? In Genesis 5, 21, 24, Enoch went to heaven. 2 Kings 2, Elijah went to heaven. But John 3, 13, Jesus says, no man has gone to heaven. Contradiction? Contradiction? No. That's a misreading of the text. Jesus did not say no one went to heaven. You're misreading it. Jesus said no one went to heaven to reveal the mysteries of heaven because notice the context. No one went up to heaven. For what? What's the context? Let's read John 3. Let's read John 3, 10 to 13. John 3, 10 to 13. Watch here. What's the context? Andy Ray, listen to the context now. What's the context? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I said unto thee, Notice the context, Andy. Uh, Andy. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. Now notice, Andy, verse 12. If I have told you earthly things and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? I'm telling you things about the earth. You don't get it, and you're from the earth. What's going to happen to you if I tell you about heaven that you haven't seen? Now that's the context. No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. What's his point here, folks? What's his point in the context? It's okay, sister. Hi. Okay, what's the context here, folks? No, that's not the context. Proverbs 30 verse 4 is not the context. What does he mean about no one going into heaven? What was the context, Andy, everyone else? No, Alethea. El Masihu Akbar, El Masihu Akbar. It's unbelievable that we can't read context. You just read it, Jake. Everyone, you just read it. Verses 10 to 12. What's the, ah, uh, Gideon, you got it, my brother. Heavenly mysteries. Heavenly mysteries. No one has gone to heaven to see heaven and come down with the revelation of heaven. I alone am from heaven, so I alone am qualified to let you know the things of heaven. That's the context. John 3, 10 to 13. What did he say to him? I speak of earthly things, things that you should know and understand because you're of the earth. You don't get it. How much more confused will you be if I talk about heavenly things that you haven't seen? So he's talking about no one up to that point entering heaven to receive revelations of what heaven is and coming down with that revelation. So even if I take that Enoch was taken to heaven and Elijah was taken to heaven, did they ever come back down with that revelation? Did they go to heaven and see what heaven is like and come down and then make known the secrets of heaven? Did they do that? When Enoch was taken, did Enoch then come back down with the revelations of heaven? Elijah was taken. Did Elijah come down with the revelations of heaven? No. There is no contradiction if you read context. You see, this is the problem with most Christians. Most Christians 
Ignore context. What's the context of John 3.13? No one has ascended in heaven, but he who came down from heaven, the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Verses 10 to 12, the context is heavenly realities. Nicodemus, you've never been to heaven. And no one's been to heaven to see what it's like and come down to tell you. But I came down from heaven. I created heaven. I was dwelling in heaven with the Father. I know heaven and I know the earth. But because you don't know what heaven's like, I'm going to keep it simple for you and tell you about the earth and use earthly examples, and you still can't get it. So imagine how much confused you'd be if I talked about heaven that you haven't seen. AZ, you serious, brother? AZ, you're kidding, right? AZ, Farmer Colby? Why you guys are hurting me? Is Paul before Christ or after Christ? Is Paul before Christ or after Christ? AZ. So after Christ, he now opens the gates of heaven and he allows servants like Paul and John to enter heaven and be given the mysteries of heaven and reported back on earth. You get it, AZ Farmer? Heaven was opened by Christ. John 3, Jesus hasn't opened heaven yet. He's on earth. Paul comes after Christ. John comes after Christ. Because of the grace of Christ, heaven is open and we have direct access to heaven because of Christ. There is no contradiction. Right? Beautiful questions. And be patient with me as I try to answer. Alethea, what does that got to do with the context? It has nothing to do with it. Because unless you believe Elijah and Enoch were not redeemed by Christ, and somehow they're not part of the body of Christ in some sense, then Augustine's answer doesn't answer anything. So you're confusing me. So stay focused. But that's assuming, here's the assumption. That's assuming Enoch and Elijah went into heaven. That's the assumption, right? Who told you Enoch went to heaven? Who told you Enoch went to heaven? Who told you that? And someone tell me who told you Enoch went to heaven? Quote Genesis 5, 21 to 24. Genesis 5, 21 to 24. Let's see. Uh-oh, I'm buffering. Yeah, I'm Sheikha. Please, my God. Father, Son, and Spirit, in Jesus' name. Please, I'm buffering. Okay. Genesis 5, 21, 24. Read with me. Read with me. And Enoch lived 60 and 5 years and begot Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begot Methuselah 300 years and begot sons and daughters. Now pay attention. And all the days of Enoch were 360 and 5 years. Pay attention. And Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. Took him where? Where did God take him? Hebrews 11, verse 5. Took him where? Where did God take him? Hebrews 11, verse 5. Hebrews 11, verse 5. Snow, I'll give you $20 million if you show me heaven. Where? It didn't say heaven. Hebrews 11, verse 5. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Where does it say he was translated, taken to heaven? Genesis 17, 1, Goldfinch. God tells Abraham, walk with him blamelessly. Does that mean Abraham was in heaven when he walked with God? But... Inky, you know Book of Enoch just proved that Jesus' words are wrong, right? You know if the Book of Enoch is true, Inky, then Jesus is wrong in John 3.13. So you can't have your cake and eat it too. Go with Enoch and throw out John. John is wrong. Okay. 2 Kings 2 verse 11. 2 Kings 2 verse 11. 
ACF, you know I don't care to answer your questions, right? And you're you're lucky I'm, I start a new policy where I don't block people for just asking questions just to start trouble. Second Kings 2.11, and it came to pass as they still went on and talked that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them, parted them both asunder and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Folks, who told you that this means heaven, the abode of God? Who told you this means heaven, the abode of God? You know what the word Hashemayim means? It means the sky, the expanse above. Let me prove it to you so you don't take my word for it. I don't want you to believe what I say. I want you to see it for yourself. Here you go. I'm going to give you the lexicon. Okay? I want you to go see that if you read these passages carefully, here it is. Hashemayim. Okay? Let me show you. Watch here. Uh, Shamayim, Shamayim plural, heavens, okay. Click on it, and I want you to go to the word Hashamayim. You'll see it there. Click on it. Folks, it's right in front of you. Here are all the examples. Guys, here you go. Click on it. Please click on it. Please don't take my word for it. Click on it. You go there, you're going to see that the word Hashamayim can mean the sky, the expanse, and the location where the sun, the moon, and stars are located. It doesn't necessarily refer to heaven, the abode of God. You with me there? It doesn't refer to heaven, the abode of God. Not necessarily. I'm not saying you can't refer to that. If you look at how the word is used, it either means the sky, the expanse where the birds fly, or where the sun and the moon, the stars are situated. So when it says he was taken in heaven, that's simply another way of saying that Elisha saw Elijah take off in the sky and disappear. You know, if I'll give you fifty million dollars where it says that God took Enoch into the sky, you know. And if you can't show me that, do you think that's block worthy? Should I block you, brother? Okay, do you understand? 2 Kings 2.11 did not say that the chariots took Elijah to God's heavenly presence. Okay. It's saying that Elisha saw Elijah enter a chariot and took off into the sky. Bill, I'm going to get to that answer in a minute. I'm going to get to the answer there. But I want you guys to follow with me. None of those passages say Enoch and Elijah entered God's heavenly abode. None of them. That's a misreading of those passages. Okay? Let me explain to you why that's a misreading, and I'm going to give you biblical support. Are you ready? I'm going to give you biblical support. Are you ready? For the biblical proof that neither one of them entered God's heavenly abode. They were taken to the nether realm, but the nether realm, the underworld, isn't God's heavenly abode. Can I prove it to you? Hebrews 11, 5 again. Hebrews 11, verse 5. Yep, Abraham's bosom, Alethea apologetics. Please listen, because you're going to see where I'm going with this. Hebrews 11, 5. Let's read it one more time. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. So where did God translate him to? I'm going to show you where he didn't translate him to. Are you ready? Hebrews 11, verses 8 to 10. Hebrews 11, verses 8 to 10. Watch here. Let's, let me show you where Enoch wasn't taken to, according to Hebrews. Now, read with me. If you're not reading these passages, you're going to get confused. Hebrews 11, verses 8 to 10. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in a tabernacle with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Now notice this. 
For he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Abraham looked for a city, not an earthly one, but a heavenly one that God made for believers to dwell in. That's what he desired. That's what he looked for. Okay, uh, you're a liar. Hashamim is used. Guys, let me expose this liar. Now this guy's got to get bounced. The liar just said, 2 Kings 2.11, doesn't use Hashamayim. You're going to have to leave for lying. I do not tolerate liars and sons of the devil. Guys, here you go. Can you see, without even needing to know Hebrew, does it say Hashamayim? Click on it. You son of Satan, I don't tolerate liars. And even if it said Shamaim, it would still embarrass you. Guys, hold on. This guy's got to go for lying through his teeth like a wicked son of Satan. I'm sorry, guys. I apologize. I won't tolerate a liar lying to our face, even though I gave you the proof. This is righteous anger here. Okay? Click on it and tell me you don't see the word Ha Shamaim. This fake who claims to know Hebrew. We will, and Danny will pray. I will not let you lie through your teeth as a son of Satan when the evidence is right there in front of our eyes. Okay? You wicked liar. And you pretend to know Hebrew because you got a Hebrew name. That's why I'm saying you're a son of Satan. To deceive these people into thinking you know Hebrew because you got a Hebrew name and you don't know Hebrew because you are an agent of the devil trying to intimidate people with your false knowledge. Knowledge that is no knowledge, you wicked agent of the devil. Glory to Jesus, you got exposed, you fraud. Isn't Jesus beautiful? Hallelujah! We love you, Lord Jesus. I'm getting excited. Yes, Azizi, it's Shmeya. Shmeya. Now, let's go back. Hebrews 11, 13 to 16. Hebrews 11, 13 to 16. Exactly, Protestant. Hebrews 11, verses 13 to 16. Watch here. These all died in faith. Not having received the promises. They died and they didn't receive the promise. What promise did they not receive? Okay. What promise did they not receive? These all died in faith. Not having received the promises. But having seen them afar off. And were persuaded of them. And embraced them. And confessed. Pay attention. That they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things. Declare plainly that they seek a country. What country? And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from once they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. They're looking for a country. What country are they looking for? What country are they looking for? But now they desire a better country. That is a heavenly. Mario, it's right there in verse 16. Heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he hath prepared to them for them a city. No, Pistol Pete. None of you are following context. Oh, let me see who Akbar. Let me see who Akbar. Verse 16 tells you. Those who died, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, wanted to enter a country that is heavenly, but they did not enter it. They died without entering that heavenly city. What more do you need to show you from the Bible that before Christ's death and resurrection and ascension, none of them entered the heavenly country. That's where they wanted to go. That's where they desired to enter, but could not enter because Christ had not come and opened the gates. Hebrews 11, 39 to 40. You guys, guys have a guy talking about male organs, folks. Come on, brethren. Hebrews 11, 39 to 40. Hebrews 11, 39 to 40. And these all having obtained a good report. And in that list, he's talking about Enoch and Abel and Samson and Joshua. He's talking about all of them. And these all having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. Guys, they did not receive the promise Abel didn't receive it. Noah didn't receive it. Enoch didn't receive it. Joshua didn't receive it. Moses, all the people mentioned, none of them received the promise. God having provided something, some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Did you catch it now? 
Hebrews 11 just said all of the Old Testament saints, and he mentions Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Joshua, Samson, even people entered Israel. None of them received the promise of a heavenly country because they could not be perfected before us. So they had to await for Christ come who perfects believers. And now that he's come, he's now opened heaven, and now they're there. Is it making sense before I move on to the next point? But folks, wait. Wasn't Enoch just mentioned in Hebrews 11.5? He's one of those that didn't enter. So how can anyone believe Enoch went to heaven? Do you see why book of Enoch cannot be scripture? Because the book of Enoch says Enoch did go to heaven. And he became one with the Son of Man, contradicting what Jesus says in John, contradicting Hebrews. You see my point? If the book of Enoch is true, John is wrong and Hebrews is wrong. Stop believing the New Testament or throw those books out. But the book of Enoch is not inspired. It's not true, though it has some truths in it. There are some true things in Enoch that you can accept, but not everything in it is true because it's not inspired and it doesn't come from Enoch. Because if John is right, that Jesus said no one has gone to heaven and seen its mysteries, and Hebrews is right, no one entered heaven when they died, then Enoch is wrong. Because Enoch says Enoch went to heaven and then revealed the mysteries of heaven. Nina, the word Shamaim in the Old Testament can mean the sky. Like if you're a Syrian, we say Shmeyah. I just said, look at that bird flying in heaven. Right? The Hebrew word Shamaim can mean sky, the expanse, or it can mean space, where the sun and moon stars are. So did everyone understand? Andy, did you understand my answer? Because I'm almost done answering it. Mo, who told you Enoch was given a vision that he recorded? Book of Enoch says he was taken to heaven. And he saw the heavenly mysteries. And he saw the Son of Man. And he became one with the Son of Man. Is there what, Nina? I don't even know what you said. I, I'm, you're confusing me now. Okay, are you with me there? So did everyone get this so far? Now, now that Jesus has come, pay attention here. Now that Jesus has come, now that Jesus died, now that Jesus has been raised, now that Jesus has entered heaven, has he now opened heaven for believers so that if you're a believer and you die in Christ, your souls and spirits enter heaven now, now that Jesus has opened heaven. Let's see. Hebrews 6, 19 and 20. Hebrews 6, 19 and 20. Watch here. I'm not done yet. Daniel, a lot of snack bar. Okay, Hebrews 6, 19 and 20. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which entereth into that Within the veil, the veil is the most holy place in heaven. Jesus has entered now the most holy place behind the veil in heaven. And because he's entered, whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. You see what it's saying? You see what it's saying? It's saying Jesus has now entered the most holy place in heaven, the tabernacle and the most holy place where God's throne is. He's now entered behind the veil as our forerunner, and he now brings us into the veil with himself. Jesus has now opened the way for us to enter heaven, God's presence, because of him. Hebrews 4, 14 and 16. No, you're wrong, Michelle. You enter heaven when you die. If you want to wait for the resurrection, then you can stay in your grave, Michelle. You can stay there. Hopefully the worms will keep you company. Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. 
Read with me. Seeing then that we have a great high priest. Guys, pay attention. Jesus, our great high priest, that is passed into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Now notice what it says in 15 and 16. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. We don't have a high priest who doesn't sympathize with us. We don't have a high priest who doesn't sympathize with us. Right? But we have a high priest that was in all points tempted like us, yet without sin. He's sinless. Now notice verse 16. Because you have such high priest, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. That means let's now enter the most holy place in heaven boldly without fear that God will strike us down because Jesus is there representing us, interceding for us, making us worthy to enter. So enter boldly. God won't consume you. He'll welcome you in because of Jesus that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Do you get it now? So when was heaven opened? When were we given the authority to enter God's heavenly presence and not be afraid of being consumed by being in his holy presence? When Jesus rose from the dead, entered the most holy place and presented his blood, his sacrifice on our behalf, making all saints worthy to now dwell in God's presence. You with me there? Did you get it so far before I move on to the next point? Uh, did you get it? Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9. 23 to 26. Hebrews 9. 23 to 26. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these. So Jesus purified them so that we could be worthy to enter there. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So the heavenly was purified by the blood of Christ, making us worthy to enter there and not defile it with our presence. Nor yet that he should suffer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. Right? For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. So he's not like these earthly high priests who enter once a year and got to keep repeating it because then Jesus would have to sacrifice himself continually. He didn't have to do that. So what did he do? But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now let me read 24 again. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Did you catch it? Jesus has entered God's heavenly presence for us. That's Hebrews 9, 24. Read it. In order to make us worthy to now enter there with him and be before God. You with me there? Everyone got it? So when could the saints enter God's heavenly presence and stand in God's heavenly presence? When Jesus entered there before the Father's presence, presenting his sacrifice to make us worthy to enter there and stay there with him. Now with that said, let's read Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. I'm almost done answering this question. Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. Almost done answering this question. Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. Okay, read with me. But you are come unto Mount Sinai. You guys got to read this or you're going to miss it. Please read it. But you are come unto Mount Sinai, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You are now approaching. Notice we can now go there. You and I can now go there. Why? Heavenly Jerusalem, where there are innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Now they're there. 
The spirits of the men of faith who died, their spirits are now there in heavenly Jerusalem with God the Father and the angels and having church there. Why? Because 24. Jesus is there, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Did you catch it? Now the spirits of humans who have died are perfected. And their spirits are now there in heaven before God the Father with the angels having church because Jesus is there, their mediator, who presented his sacrifice to the Father and saying, I have made them worthy to enter our presence in heaven and to stay here with us. You got it, Remy. Elijah and Enoch went to Sheol, Abraham's bosom. They were not taken to God's heavenly presence. They only entered after Jesus opened the way and said, come on in. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Moses, and Joshua, David, and Solomon, Isaiah, and Jeremiah, Elijah, and Elisha, welcome. The gate has opened. Time to come home. Your father awaits. Enter. Snow, when I get to heaven and see it, then I'll come back and make a video and tell you how it's going to be like. Only now some truth, Anna? You mean up until this point I was teaching falsehood? <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much. Up until this time, I thought I was teaching truth. But according to you, finally some truth. That means all this time was heresy. Thank you for not condemning me, right? And yeah, this other brother told me, hey, can you write a se uh, do a session on what it's going to be like in heaven? When I enter heaven and I see what it's like and come back, I'll do a YouTube session. Deal? You want me to talk about heaven? I don't know anything about heaven apart from what the Bible says. What do you want? When I enter, I'll come back and say, when I, when I go honestly, I'll go to heaven and say, Lord, I made a promise to someone on earth that when I see heaven, I'd come back and do a YouTube session. Do you give me permission to come back for at least an hour? But you know, my sessions are about three hours. Can you give me five hours? I'll do a session. I'll come right back. Oh, oh my goodness. Woo. Exactly, Ariel. Come back. Good. All right. Now, Sharabal, you can't ask me about, about purgatory. That's a uniquely Roman Catholic tradition. Ask the Roman Catholics why they believe in purgatory. And then hear the different perspectives, Orthodox and others, about it, brother. Okay, now, coming back to this issue, final thing I want you to do, write this down. Write this down, okay? We're not going to read all of it. I want you to write down 1 Corinthians 15. Read the entire chapter. But read specifically 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 to 23. Write this down, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 to 23. And then write 1 Corinthians 15, 45 to 58. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 to 58. Okay, why? Paul says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. Let me explain what I mean. Okay, Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. What does he mean by that? If you live in a body that's corrupt, decaying, perishing, and sinful, that body, you cannot enter heaven with it. Why? Because it'll be inevitable that if you enter heaven with that body, you're going to sin and be thrown out. So then Paul says, we will have to be transformed. Our bodies will be transformed in a twinkling of an eye where our sinful desires will be removed and our bodies made incorruptible. And those are the only bodies suitable for heaven. So this body can't enter heaven because I will sin and be expelled. You with me there? You understand what I'm saying? You with me there? Okay. Therefore, if you believe Enoch and Elijah entered heaven, then their bodies had to be transformed and made incorruptible. But you got a problem. 1 Corinthians 15 says, Jesus is the first one with that incorruptible body. Everyone else will receive incorruptible bodies when he returns to raise the dead and transform those living on earth. No one has an incorruptible physical body besides Jesus. But if you believe Enoch and Elijah went to heaven and they didn't die, then you have to believe their bodies were transformed. So they had incorruptible bodies before Jesus. 
That's not going to happen, right? Because Jesus is the first fruits, right? Right? And that's all in 1 Corinthians 15. Read it. That means they cannot have physical bodies and enter heaven. So that's number one. So we already established they didn't enter heaven. But if they did enter heaven, their bodies would have to be changed, which can't happen because Jesus is the first with that incorruptible body. That means their bodies were discarded. And that's what you read in Hebrews 12, 23. Enoch and Elijah are spirits there. They're not spirits with bodies. Remember what you read in Hebrews 12, 23? You've come to Emily, Jerusalem, where the spirits of the men made perfect dwell. Why? Because in some mysterious way, when Elijah and Enoch were transferred to the nether realm, to Sheol, Hades, to Abraham's bosom, God somehow rid them of bodies, so they entered there as spirits. Their bodies were gone. No, Lazarus did not see heaven, Vino. He did not see heaven. He went to Abraham's bosom. No, Nina. Nina. Are you a Syrian, Nina? Why are you confusing Jesus' resurrection and Lazarus' resurrection, Nina? Are you a Syrian? Nina. Why are you confusing Jesus' resurrection with Lazarus' resurrection? Do you know what it means for Jesus to be the firstborn from the dead? You just said Christ is the firstborn from the dead, but also Lazarus was raised. Do you know what it means for Jesus to be the firstborn from the dead? Yes, John Doe, you got it. Jesus is the first one who was raised immortal, incorruptible. Nina, when Lazarus was raised, did he die again? Did he die again? Lazarus was raised in a corruptible body, earthly life, and he would die again. Please don't confuse that with Jesus being the firstborn from the dead. That's a different context. It's talking about the first one to rise, immortal, thereby triumphing, destroying death, becoming deathless. No one before Christ has become deathless. Exactly, Candace. He was more like resuscitated. Bewitched. Were you here 20 minutes ago when I answered John 3.13? I just spent 20 minutes answering John 3.13. Were you here 20 minutes ago when I started the answer to John 3.13? Kares, you're defining death differently from the way the Bible does. The Bible defines physical death where... Your eyes shut, your spirit leaves your bodies. Are you telling me God can't take two people alive and as he's transferring them to the netherworld, somehow miraculously get them to discard their bodies in that <clears throat> transportation? When it says they didn't die, it's talking about our earthly experience of death. Where you see someone die and their body is buried, Kares. That didn't happen. Their bodies, they disappeared. And somehow, in some mysterious way, in that <clears throat> transference from one realm to the next, God got rid of their bodies. But what it means here that he didn't taste death, it means death as we, as we see it, as we experience it. Because what happens? A person dies and you bury their body into the tomb. That never happened to Enoch because he was taken to another realm. But how do you know what happened when he went to that other realm? As he's being transported, God is able to then get rid of the body as he enters that realm. But what happened is they didn't see that. They didn't see the body die and return to the dust. What's the problem? No, that's irrelevant, Brata. Don't go into that. No, nowhere does the Bible say you won't have blood in your body. When you're resurrected. Flesh and blood means something else. Don't don't get too technical, Brata, please. I don't want to have to then put you in your place out of love. Okay. You with me there? Does anyone understand what is happening now? I'm actually Assyrian. I'm an Assyrian supremacist. Don't you ever call me Arab because I'm going to hurt you, brother, and repent later. 
Okay, now before I move on to other questions, did you understand the answer to this question? You see why it's hard to answer a question? Because I'm, in, I'm interacting with your comments and questions to this topic. Exactly, Sharbel, because my Assyrian ancestors went to Lebanon and planted seed. You're the seed of my Assyrian ancestors, Sharbel. Don't hate, participate. Okay. Everyone with me there? Did everyone got the answer now? Okay. Did everyone got the answer now? What's the answer? Enoch and Elijah did not enter God's heavenly abode. Enoch and Elijah did not enter the netherworld, netherworld, the Sheol, the underworld, with bodies of any kind. They entered there as spirits. And as spirits, they would have a shape, a spiritual shape and form by which you can identify them. But their bodies somehow were discarded and gotten rid of by God. When it says Enoch did not taste death, understand what that means biblically. Death as we see it, as we experience it. A person dies, we bury the body. That did not happen to Enoch. But it doesn't mean that when God transported him, transferred him from one realm to the next, that God didn't get rid of that body. We know he got rid of that body because in Hebrews 12, 23, it says the spirits of just men who are now perfected, they're there in heaven as spirits, not with flesh bodies. Right? Hebrews 12, 23, spirits of just men made perfect. Where are their bodies? Gone, done away with. Is Enoch one of those spirits in heaven? Yes. What about Elijah? Yes. The only one. I got to be careful here. We know Jesus is in a glorified physical body in heaven. No, what did he say? What did he say? I don't know what he said. No, Nathan, I'm not. I'm going to leave you behind. I won't explain my view of the rapture. Okay. Did, who didn't get the point? Say, I'm still confused. Who didn't get the point? Tell me, I'm still confused. If you got it, I can move on to other questions. Shabazz, because you know what? They didn't have American Airlines or Delta. So <clears throat> the angels came and took them into the sky to take them from one place to the next. Because Shabazz, they didn't have American Airlines or Delta. So they couldn't book a ticket to fly from one dimension to the next. So that's why they went into the skies. Who didn't get the the response? Diego, why don't you know that I have done sessions on this, dozens of sessions and about dozens of articles. Can you go back and search and not be lazy and find the answer there, brother? Okay, I'm asking the question, is anyone still confused? If not, I can move on to the next question. Everyone got it? You understand now what the Bible teaches? No one entered God's heavenly presence until Jesus opened the gates of heaven and made us worthy to enter God's heavenly presence. Before anyone calls me, I got to make sure you got the answer and understood it. Now you understood what happened to Elijah and Enoch, right? They did not enter heaven and definitely did not enter heaven with bodies. No, they're not angels. They are spirit creatures with spiritual shapes like angels, but they're not angels. Okay, so good. Everyone got it? Glory to Jesus. You got it? Because I can go to the next questions. Why would I think all Arabs are Muslims? There are Arabic Christians that are not Muslims and hate Islam. Okay. Glory to God, glory to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. May he save me from error and stammering and confusion and bless you. And I pray that I can educate you, bless you, and entertain you for the glory of Jesus. All right. Let's dance. This music. Hold on. Ha! All right. <laughs> 
Hello, brother. How you doing, man? I'm all right, man. No, it's all good. In the hood. What's up? Yeah, this is this how you doing, man. I had a question for you. But first of all, I want to thank you for all that you do, man. God bless you, bro. The time that you spend explaining that to us, bro, that takes patience. And I appreciate you, brother. Bro, I, I was thinking you. about becoming a doctor so I can have much patience. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding, bro. Roger that. Yeah. But anyway, I come with the Holy Spirit. And I have a question for you. And my question is, can our sin keep us from heaven? Yeah. After accept after accepting Christ as our Savior. Yeah, you're asking me whether you can lose your salvation, right? Right. Well, well I already know the answer, but I was wanted to see your point on it. So then why are you asking me, brother? Because I wanted to see, because um, I like coming to your, your rooms, watching you. Yeah. And I think one day I came in and I kind of left confused because I, I might have misunderstood you, my brother. Yeah. Okay. Right. But I know you are a child of God. Believe me, there's no doubt in my mind that you are. Oh, thank but you. But I thought maybe you, I thought maybe you had said something to the fact that uh, say? our sin that we can lose our salvation. Can? Yes. Yeah. There. That's that's the whole point. Most Christians historically, even today, think you can lose your salvation because there are passages that talk about it. Are you saying can or can't? Can. With a T. Can. Okay, can. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right, okay. Because right, there are passages okay. that people point to to show you can lose salvation, and that's been the majority position of the church and even the majority position today. Right, and and, I, and for me, I know that we can't. Okay. Right. Well, that's, uh, that's, you're you entitled that, to your right? opinion. Yeah, you're entitled to your opinion, yeah. I mean, what, do, do you believe we can? The Bible has plenty of passages to say you can, and so I can't be the person who the first time in Christian history solves the tension of those scriptures because I just said historically in the past and the majority today believe you can lose salvation and there are Christians who think you can now unless you think I came down from heaven to solve this tension it ain't going to happen well I believe but the way I think of it because God is a very smart intelligent God right yeah, He's see, not, now, do me some brother do me some brother listen listen don't appeal uh -huh. to emotive language and tell me what you think. And God is very smart because if you do that, you're insulting people who disagree with you by impugning them, by th accusing and, them and, of thinking God is not smart. Yeah. You don't do and that. I, and I apologize. Yeah. I, I really apologize. I really don't come with no ill wills at all. I am a true no, Christian. I, understand. I, I love Jesus. Right? I now, love brother, Jesus. brother, let, me, let me help you. See, mm -hmm. now we're talking. Yes. Let another mm -hmm. man praise you and let another man tell you what you are. When you keep praising yourself, that does come off as arrogance. So if you really want to learn, mm -hmm. Proverbs okay, yes. 27 verse 2 says, let another man praise you. So yes. it would be helpful for you as a Christian. Stop telling me what you are and what you think you are. Mm -hmm. Let your actions be the proof. And so let the mouths of believers testify whether you're a Christian or not. Right. And, and I, you're right. You know what I'm and, and, and also I just want to say that I what I believe is, when Jesus died on the cross for our sins, yeah. it says that there should be no condemnation. If I believe, because no sin should enter heaven. So if I have a bad dream, right? Mm -hmm. If I die before a bad dream, before I wake up from having a bad dream, that means I can lose my salvation because no sin yeah. should enter. That's why I think God took that away. He took the whole thing away from Satan. Being and you quoted Romans 8, right? Cross. Romans 8, 1? You, that's, what gonna, you, that's what you just quoted. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ yes. Jesus, Romans 8, one. Isn't it interesting that St. Paul in Romans 11 warns Christians that if they don't persist in faith, they'll be cut off and discarded like God did for Israel. So why are you quoting one verse and ignoring the other verses from the same book? And, and, I, and I'm not, because I, I see like Romans 5.19. So or which, brother, which part of Romans 11 wasn't it. clear? Notice what you're doing again. You're playing Bible ping pong yeah. with me. You're not listening. The same Paul yes. who wrote Romans 5 and 519 wrote Romans 11. Mm -hmm. Why do you then conveniently choose those parts of Paul that you like? But when I told you the same Paul in the same book, Romans 11, warns mm -hmm. those that if they don't persist in faith, they'll be cut off and discarded. So you just have Paul contradicting himself. This is why I say this is an issue that's above your pay grade and above my pay grade. You're not going to resolve the tension, but do not do what people like to do. Quote only those verses they like to quote and ignore those verses that pose a challenge to their position. And I'm trying to help you, but you're not listening. No, I'm listening to you, brother. I, I am. So what I, do you do in Romans 11? 
my, my pastor is uh, Joseph Prince. That's my pastor, right? Please. I don't know if you know who. No, I don't. I don't, you know I don't really need is. to. Know. Brother, pastor, listen, uh, listen, brother, Prince, brother, brother. He's my pastor. Brother. Yes. We're gonna end the conversation because you're doing what they call name dropping. I don't care if. <clears throat> Who, uh, if Billy Graham was your your pastor, that don't impress yes. me. Stop the name dropping and stop telling me how much uh -huh. what a Christian you are, bro. Go read Romans eleven. When you do, come back to me, bro. Sorry, I'm not trying to be harsh with you, but you're saying my pastor is your Let I me tell you something, if, real quickly. If, we're talking past Satan each other. Can, if I can lose my my okay, salvation, bye bye, brother. God bless you. Then I, there's no, then I, I, I have no bye bye, brother. I, God bless you. Ahead. Bye bye, brother. Take care. Yes, sir. This guy thinks I'm a fan of Joseph Joseph Prince. Worst name you could have mentioned to me was Joseph Prince, but that just tells you what happens when you drop names. Hey, bro, Joseph Prince, baby. The only Joseph that was a prince is the Joseph, the son of Jacob, the prince of Egypt. Player. That's the only Joseph that I recognize as a prince. Player. Okay, now you understand what I was trying to communicate to the brother who wanted to hear himself more than he wanted to hear me give a response. The brother wanted to pontificate. You understand? Atu, can you call me so I can be harsher with you, Atu? Please, Atu, make my day. Please, Atu, call me. Please, I want to be so harsh with you. You understand what I was trying to say to this guy? Historically, this is a fact. Listen up. Historically, this is a fact. Hold on, Mickey. Hold on, brother. Brother, hold on. Don't hang up. Let me make, finish this point. Let me finish this point. Historically, this is a fact. This is a fact. Christians have held to the position you can walk away from Christ, cut yourself off from Christ, and lose salvation. That's been the historical position of the church. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Today, it's still the majority position. Most Christians believe you can lose salvation. And this is what I was trying to tell the brother. You're going to quote to me Romans 5.1, Romans 5.19, Romans 8.35.39. And they're going to quote to me John 15, verses 1 <clears throat> all the way to 8. Romans 11, Hebrews 6, 4 to 6, Hebrews 10, 26. To, see, I know it. Been there, got, got, got done that, got the T-shirt. I got a lot of T-shirts, guys. What's my point? My point is, if you believe you can lose salvation, you're going to focus on those passages that teach you can lose salvation, and the passages that <clears throat> give the appearance that if you're truly a believer, you'll be kept forever and you can't lose salvation, those you'll explain away or ignore. But if you believe you can't lose salvation, you're going to focus on those passages that talk about being secure in Christ and that you'll never be cut off and either explain away those other passages or ignore them. That's what I'm trying to get at. This is a debate we're not going to solve until Jesus returns, and I'm not going to solve the debate for you. I'm not that smart, and I'm not trying to be humble and being honest. I am not that smart. I do not have the answer. Okay. See, now notice the blasphemer here. You see, I told you, he just exposed himself, and he said he's a Christian, and you want me to say he's not a son of the devil? The goat's blood is stronger than Jesus' blood. You see what a wicked demon he is? But my pastor is Joseph Prince, brother. Yeah, yeah, I know you a Christian. But now you just bore witness against yourself. You said I'm a Christian, right? And as a Christian, I say you're a tool of the devil. You can't condemn me now because you just said, I know you a Christian, brother. So this Christian saying you a tool of the devil, sucker. See, he just insulted Christians. He said, yeah, the blood of the goat is greater than the blood of Jesus. Do you think because if you don't agree with me, I'm going to attack you, sucker. The blood of Jesus, you know what I'm saying? The blood of the goat can't undermine the blood of Jesus. Okay. Go ahead, Mickey. Call me, brother. Call me, brother. Call me and call me, brother. Call me and call me, brother. So I want you to do two things, Mickey. Call me and call me, brother. Don't call me, daughter. Go ahead. Go ahead, bro. I'm waiting for you. Don't be scared. I'm your friend. Earth calling Mickey. Come in, Mickey. Okay, folks. Mickey's connection is bad. What is it? Okay. Car booster. As long as you're not going to hijack my car, call me. 
As long as you're not going to hijack my car, call me. Any questions or do you want me to wrap it up? Because we still got a good crowd and I still got time. You know? Yeah, bro. The blood of the goat, man, is stronger than the blood of Jesus, according to you, my brother. My brother. Right. All righty. Let's try. Come on, Mickey. Talk to me. Talk to me. Mickey, don't make me block you, brother. No. Mickey, yeah, I got to send you on your merry way. Okay, bye-bye, bro. Okay, Mickey. Car boost, are you there? there? I guess not. Okay, any questions from the comment section? Mickey, if you're going to call me again and not respond, I'm going to block you on Skype. You know that, bro, right? Because you're hurting my feelings now. You get me excited to hear your voice. You don't speak and you break my heart. You're doing to me what all the Christian women did in my life. Ignore me, pretend they wanted my attention, and then turn their backs on me. Why would you abuse me this way? Why are you opening open, uh, you know, old scars, old, old wounds? Why are you hurting me? Why are you treating me like all the Christian sisters, right? That pretend they give me attention, and then when they got me eating out of their hand, they walk away and dump me. Okay, any other questions, guys? Yes, may I help you? May I help you? Here goes the more mic again. May I help you? Mel Gibson. Okay. Is this Mickey again? Oh, it's David Woos. Hello. We got a guy, a Muslim. Yes, may I help you, Mel Gibson? Okay, these guys got to go. Yeah. All right, good. What's up, buddy? Yeah. Friend, what's wrong with your... Can you hear me? A little bit. Go ahead. Go ahead this year, buddy. Okay. I'm going to give you five seconds. Can you hear me? If you don't get to the question, I'm going to block you, and then you can be heard in Asheron. Question. Tell me... Tell me the verse. Tell me the verse where Enoch is going to shield to the hell. Yeah. I just wasted 40 minutes, and this guy's telling me to tell him. Tell me why you suck as an actor and you can't make it in Hollywood. Tell me why you suck as an actor and you can't make it in Hollywood. All right. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Any other questions? Let's take it. Sam, is that guy in the mafia? Yeah. I just want to know why he sucks as an actor and can't make it in Hollywood. Hey, uh, uh, Blah, you got to go, bro. You can't be in this uh, channel anymore, bro, because you just insulted Trinitarians who don't think like you because you think you're God's gift to ex exegesis. Brother, you got to go. Send this man back to Prince. To Josepha Princess. Okay, what's the question? I'm looking for sincere questions because we're wasting time now. We still have 290. Okay. No, brother, don't ask me about Sola Scriptura because I already saw people attacking Sola Scriptura. If I talk about Sola Scriptura, you guys are not going to want to hear me out. You're going to want to attack and criticize. Don't ask me a question that you don't sincerely want an answer for. Folks, please ask me sincere questions that you want answers for. Ask me sincere questions that you want answers for. Don't ask me questions to set me up. Please, guys. Okay, any questions? Because we're wasting time now. Okay, amen. Muhammad ibn Jars worships Jesus, loves Jesus. May the Lord Jesus shine his face on him and seal him by his spirit and protect him. Edric, my brother from different mother. Edric, my brother from different mother. I'll answer Mark 13.32 if people want me to answer it. But you know I have sessions on Mark 13.32, right? I have sessions where I explain Mark 13.32. I have articles explaining Mark 13.32. It is so easy for you brothers and sisters to go on my YouTube channel and put in Mark 13.32 or Jesus Knowing the Day and Hour, and you're going to see I have multiple videos on it. Or go to my blog, answeringislamblog.wordpress.com, answeringislamblog.wordpress.com 
or answeringislam.net and do a search, Mark 13, 32. I have dozens of articles on that passage. But let me again explain to people what he's asking me. In Mark 13, 32, Jesus says, Of the dare hour no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father alone. I've answered this repeatedly. Do you guys want me to answer this again? God bless you. Do you guys want me to answer that again? Or do you want me to answer another question? I know you want, Diego. If I get more yeses than noes, then sure. Okay, we got an, we got more no's. Okay, all right, that's a golden look for it. Okay, anyone with a sincere question? Guys, I don't want to waste time here so that when people come and listen, they'll get bored. Any other questions? I don't know if I, I, I'm that, that's my role. Okay, I'm sorry. Right. I don't know if that's my role, Hannah. What's going on? Sister, can you speak? What's up, Sam? Uh, hold on, brother. I got, I thought I was getting called from Hefsa for Christ. You don't sound like Hefsa <laughs> unless Hefsa changed your voice. No, this is not Hafsa. This is Hafsa, Hafsa. Oh, I'm okay. I'm Hafsa. sorry. I thought it was Hefsa for Christ. Hey, Hefsa, you got someone else, you know, that has your name but sounds like a guy. What happened, Hefsa for Christ? Did you change your gender? You know, that's a sin. Go ahead, brother. Go ahead. Ask me your question. Yes, my question is, you'll be criticizing we go again. Uh, polygamy in Islam, right? Now, my question to you is uh, regarding, is there any limit when it comes to Deuteronomy 22, yeah. 28 to 29? Is yeah. there any limit if you rape a woman, you got to marry her? Okay, now, How many? Is there any limit to that? Do you want me to answer your question or you're asking to embarrass yourself because I'll end up embarrassing you? I'm asking a question. Is there any limit? Answer my open, question. I open chapter games. 3, verse 50 of the Quran so I can embarrass you now. Open Sirat al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 50. Read it for me. Don't tap dance from I your Quran. Go to Sirat al-Imran. Okay, it, brother, one I'm more time. Go to be chapter 3. Well, I, I can't be a ask man because I'm not your you prophet. Answer my question and okay. ask me. And Chapter ask me 3, you want. verse 50 of your Quran. I know you're ashamed of your prophet because he wasn't a man. He was a woman raping whore. So go to chapter 3, verse 50. Don't be ashamed of your prophet. I'm ashamed of him, but you don't need to be because you believe that filthy dog is a prophet. So go to chapter 3, verse 50. I'm going to answer to you. I'm asking chapter you a 3, verse 50. Are you going to answer my question or not? Okay. You see what kind of dog he is? He named himself Hafsa Christ. He 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 called himself Hafsa Christ. Okay. Let me answer the question for Muhammad's dog. Are you ready for the answer? I'll answer the question for you guys. Are you ready? So Hafsa he was using your name. He called himself Hafsa Christ. I don't mean insult dogs. That's why I thought it was you. Okay, Hafsa Christ. You see, he's a dog like his prophet. His prophet had no honor. But let me answer the question. In their desperation, they try to go to the Old Testament. Let me answer the question for you guys to show you how to deal with these dogs of the devil and show why Muhammad is a filthy dog of the devil who deserves to burn in hell. Glory to Jesus. Let me now explain to you what he was trying to do. In the Old Testament, God permits what's called polygyny. Can I answer this question? Because this is a question you guys need to know the answer for. Are you ready? Are you ready? You guys ready for the answer? In the Old Testament, God permitted what's called polygamy, where a man could have multiple wives. Okay. Why then do we condemn Muhammad, the son of Satan, for having multiple wives? Are you now ready for the answer? Because these demons will quote the Bible thinking it helps Muhammad, but they don't realize that the Bible proves Muhammad is a dog who is burning in hell under the feet of Jesus. And I, I apologize to dogs. Okay. Let's go to Matthew 19, and let's read what our Lord said in verses 1 to 6. Guys, pay attention to the answer, because these dogs are going to quote the Bible to try to justify what their woman-raping whore did. This man who raped women, whored women, and dishonored women. Okay, And they claim he's a prophet, the son of Satan. Go to Matthew 19, verses 1 to 6. Let me answer that question for you. Okay, And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came unto the coasts, of Judea beyond Jordan, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there, 
right? The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him and saying unto him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Is it lawful? Can he do it? And he answered and said unto them, have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And he said, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and the twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain, two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Now, they're shocked at what Jesus said. One man, one woman, come together, one flesh. Let no human being dissolve that union that God has, has produced and created between male and female. So now let's read 7 all the way to 9. 7 all the way to 9. They say unto him, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and put her away? He hath, he saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication and shall marry another, committeth adultery, and whoso, whoso marrieth her, which is put away, doth commit adultery. Did you catch what our Lord said? Our Lord said the reason why God allowed Moses to permit you to divorce is because of your stubborn hearts, because of your sinful hearts, because of your wicked hearts. In other words, guys, remember this. Now I'm teaching you how to interpret the Bible. There are things in the Old Testament, concessions that God made not because it was his ideal standard, but because in his love and humbleness, he stooped to the level of his pe people to meet them where they were at and allow them to do things that he wasn't necessarily pleased with until Christ came to elevate us to a higher standard. Do you understand what you just re read from the Lord? Do you understand what you just read from the Lord? Let me repeat it again. Jesus just told you, not everything in the Old Testament is God's ideal, his standard of doing things. God allowed and made concessions for a stubborn people, for a wicked people, for a rebellious people, met them where they were at and allowed them to engage in certain practices, tolerated it until the coming of Christ. Are you with me there? This is the principle. You'll also find that, write down Deuteronomy 17, 14 to 20. Deuteronomy 17, verses 14 to 20. First Samuel chapters 8 to 10. Write these down. Guys, write these down. Deuteronomy 17, verses 14 to 20. First Samuel chapters 8 to 10. Why? Because God made another concession. God told Moses that when they enter the land, guys, you're going to learn a lot. You're going to get meat right now. I'm giving you meat. So by the power of the Holy Spirit, please listen. This is meat for you guys to know how to interpret the Bible, okay? God told Moses when they enter the land, they're going to ask for a king. They're going to ask for a king, right? And when they ask for a king, here is the criteria. So God already knew in advance during the time of Moses, before Moses died, he goes, this is what they're going to do. When they enter the land and settle there, they're going to want a king. Here's the criteria. 1 Samuel 8, 1 Samuel 8. The people start complaining to Samuel. We want a king like the other nations. And Samuel was hurt. Why? Why do you want a human king over you? God is your king. Be satisfied with him. And they go, no, we want a human king. And you know what God told Samuel? You know what God told Samuel? He goes, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. Don't feel bad. They're rejecting me. They're not happy and satisfied with me as their king. So you know what? Give them what they want. Give them the desires of their heart. Give them a human king. So God even condescended to give them a human king, even though it broke God's heart. Read it. It says broke his heart. Because then they would realize their mistake. You don't want me as king. You want a human king? Go ahead. And this is what God does, folks. God will often give you what you want to learn the hard way why what you want wasn't best for you. And then you suffer the consequences. Then you come to your senses and said, man, what did I do to myself? 
And that's what they learn. Because God warned them, look, if I give you a human king, he's going to lord it over you. He's going to take your daughters for his wives. He's going to take your sons and turn them into soldiers. He's going to then <clears throat> impose taxes on you. But that's what you want. That's what you get. And they learn the hard way through their history that once a human king began ruling over them, they realized the mistake they made. They realized the hardship and the oppression inflicted on them because of their desire for a human king as opposed to wanting God to be their king. You get my point? Now you understand the principle here. God is tolerating and making concessions for a people that are stiff-necked and stubborn and will not submit and yield to the Spirit to empower them to take it to a higher level. And that's what Jesus said. And now Jesus says, that's done away with. Now I call you to a higher standard. I bring you back to the standard that God had set from the beginning. One man, one woman. So now let's go to 1 Corinthians 7, verses 1 to 5. Karina, you know you're going to get, get out of here, right? Because you just blasphemed God. Karina, I don't want to insult you because I don't want to insult dogs. They're better than you. I told you one of the rules here. If you insult God, you're going to be thrown out. So I know you're upset that you don't know who your father is because when your mother did muta with the Shia, she did, you know, there was 20. So you know which one of them is your father. It's okay. We understand. But don't get upset at us. Get upset at your mommy. All right. 1 Corinthians 7 verses 1 to 5. 1 Corinthians 7 verses 1 to 5. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote, you wrote, pay attention. Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. It is good for you to be sexually abstinent, to be celibate so you can devote yourself entirely to God, right, and ministry. But now notice what he says. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, not wives, and let every woman have her own husband, not husbands. You see what Jesus did. He now restored the original standard for husband and wife because now he's going to elevate believers by his spirit as we yield to the spirit to that standard. Instead of God coming down to our level, God is now lifting us up to his level by the Holy Spirit. If we don't resist, okay? Now notice three to five. Let's read three to five, okay? Three, three to five. Sorry about that. Watch here. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. Defraud, I'm sorry, the wife hath no power over her own body. Women, your body doesn't belong to you, it belongs to your husband. But now notice the beauty. But the husband likewise, also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Look at how amazing. And beautiful Jesus is. He tells wives, when you're married, it's not your body. You don't use your body as a weapon to punish your husband. If he wants to be intimate, you let him be intimate. Likewise, husband, your body is not yours. She has rights over your body. And she owns your body, not some other woman. She owns your body. You don't deny her. And you don't share your body with other women committing adultery because she has exclusive rights over your body. Now notice verse 5. Defraud ye not. Do not deny each other sexual intimacy. Right? Except it be with consent for a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontent... Oh, this is all the English. <laughs> Incontumacy. Okay, understand the beauty of Jesus here? Two things. Number one, Jesus restores... The ideal for marriage. God tolerated a lot that he didn't agree with, he didn't like, he didn't accept, and he hated. Because of the condition of his people. They were so corrupt, so sinful, so stiff-necked, he tolerated it. Number two, notice what our Lord does. He shows the man you are to have only one wife as the woman is to only have one husband. Christians, did you see what Paul said? If you're burning with se uh, sexual desire, you don't fornicate. 
You don't fornicate. You don't sleep with a girl. You don't sleep with a man. There is no sexual relations before marriage. There is no sexual intimacy before marriage. There is no, oh, he's my boyfriend. She's my girlfriend. Let's shack up. Let's sleep with each other because we'll eventually get married. That's not what Paul said. Paul said, if you're burning, you get you a wife. You're burning, get your husband. No fornication, no hookups, no premarital sex. You get married and then have all the sex you want with God's blessing. You caught it there? See what he said? And notice again the beauty of our God. He says to the woman, woman, that's not your body. Your, your husband owns it. So don't deny him sexual intimacy. And husband, it's not your body. She owns it. Don't deny her and don't share it with others. You know why this is amazing? Those of you who've been married can testify. Oftentimes, what a woman will do when she's angry, she'll punish the husband by refusing to sleep with him. But she doesn't realize that she's opening a door for satanic temptation. Because when you deny your husband and he's burning with passion, that's when Satan comes in and whispers in his ear, watch what you shouldn't be watching, lust women that you shouldn't be lusting after, or go find you someone and commit adultery. You do not realize, woman, you're being used as a tool of the devil to drive this man to adultery and marital unfaithfulness. But then we want to see what he says to the man. Men, men, your body is hers. She has exclusive rights over it. Don't you dare go and give your body to some other woman or other women, plural. She owns your body. She alone can enjoy it. Don't you go and give your body to someone else or others. Do you see why we're for monogamy? Do you see why we're in? Because Jesus did it. So now notice what this Mohammedan demon did. This wicked demon of the devil did. He wants to go back to the Old Testament. Ignore the New Testament because he realizes the New Testament condemns Muhammad as a son of Satan as a wicked, immoral dog who deserves the hell that he's in. Glory to Jesus. But it's going to get worse for the Mohammedan. You want me to show you how worse it's going to get for him? Not only is Muhammad condemned by Jesus, condemned as a son of Satan, Muhammad is condemned by his own teaching. You know why? Wasn't it Muhammad who said in chapter 4, verse 3, that if you can be fair... Marry up to four wives. If not, have only one wife. That's chapter 4, verse 3 of the Quran. But did Muhammad end up with 11 wives instead of the four that he imposed on others? And not only that, do not the Hadith state, and doesn't chapter 33 of the Quran, verses 50 all the way to 53, show Muhammad was anything but fair to his wives? He preferred some wives over others, neglected some wives for others. So not only is Muhammad condemned as a satanic dog by Jesus, Muhammad is condemned by his own teachings as a fraud, as a sexual pervert and a whoremonger, by his own teachings. You see why he didn't want to answer my questions? You see why he didn't want to answer my questions? He wanted to run and tap dance to Deuteronomy. You got it, right? Why he was scared? So not only does Jesus condemn Muhammad as a filthy, whoremongering pervert, Muhammad is condemned by his own teachings. Don't forget, chapter 4, verse 3 of the Quran. Muhammad said, if you can be fair, have four wives. If not, only one, and as many as your right hands possess. But then Muhammad, in chapter 33, verses 50 to 53, gave himself... License. You can have as many wives as you want, not just four. In fact, he had about 11 and nine when he died. And if a woman offers herself to you, you can take her and not pay the mahar, the dowry. And this is a privilege only for you, only for you, Muhammad, because you're special. You're special, Muhammad. You're so special. You're special. Only you, Prophet of Allah, you're so special. I'm special. 
So Muhammad not only stands condemned by the teachings of Jesus, his God and judge and master, Muhammad stands condemned by his own Quran, which exposes him as a filthy, whoremongering pervert. Why, Muhammad, they can only have four, but you can't have 11? Why must they pay a dowry, Mahar, but you are free from paying a dowry if a woman agrees to give herself to you and you don't have to give her the dowry? What makes you so special, you pervert? Because you are a son of Satan. And let alone the fact you preferred Aisha above all the other wives and you ignored some wives. Let me tell you how evil this man is. Chapter 33 Verses 50 to 53 of the Quran. Chapter 33, verses 50 to 53. Let me tell you how evil this man is. According to the Muslim sources, chapter 4, verses 127, 128. Those passages were revealed. Can I tell you how what a dirty pervert Muhammad was? Muhammad had married a woman named Sauda, Sauda bin Zama'a. Sauda bin Zama'a. Some will say Sauda binti Zama'a. Muhammad wanted to divorce her. Do you know why? The hadith say she was a very large, fat woman. And Muhammad wasn't attracted to her. So he wanted to divorce her. You know what she did, this poor woman? Guys, let me tell you what kind of sick, pervert son of Satan this man is. You ready? You know what he did? He wanted to divorce her because she was fat and old. It says she was an old, fat woman, a large, fat woman. He wanted to divorce her. She came to him and made a deal. She goes, please don't divorce me because in paradise, I want to be one of your wives. Make a deal with me. Keep me as your wife, but you don't have to visit me. The day assigned to me where you come and visit me and spend time with me, you can give it to Aisha. And you know what he said? Okay. And as God said, okay. And as God sent down chapter four, verses 127, 128 says, great. If that's the deal, take it, run with it. What kind of sick pervert would do that to a woman where he says, okay, I won't visit you. You stay at home by yourself. You'll still be my wife, but I won't visit you. And that day I'll assign it to Aisha. So now I have two days to spend with my child bride so I can play with her dolls and then <clears throat> play with her dress and wear her dress and defile her. And Allah said, you ready to go, prophet. Excellent, man. Way to go, Sada. Does anyone have any respect for this sick, wicked demon, the son of Satan? Mistreated women, abused women. And folks, I don't know if you know it. For each one of his wives, he had a home. He had 11 wives, and each one of them had a home. He owned 11 houses. He owned 11 homes. Because each wife had to be given a home of their own. And supposedly, he was supposed to visit them on a specific day. But some he visited more than others. Some he didn't visit at all, like Sauda. Sauda, he left her in her home and didn't visit her anymore. But took that day and gave it to Aisha and spent two days with Aisha as opposed to one day. And the wives complained, folks. The wives said, why does he show preferential treatment to Aisha what makes her better than us? They even sent his daughter, Fatima. This is in Bukhari and Muslim. Fatima to go and tell him, hey, you got to stop neglecting us and showing Aisha preferential treatment. When Fatima went to Muhammad, you know what he said? You know what he said? You know what he said? He said, do not hurt me concerning Aisha because the only woman in whose dress I wear <clears throat> when I receive revelation is Aisha. You see what he justified? He justified spending time with Aisha because she's the only woman whose dress I put on that Allah then sends revelation upon me. I only receive revelation when I'm with her in her dress and not any other woman. So please don't hurt me because I want to receive more revelation. If I'm with any of the other wives, Revelation doesn't come down. But for some reason, when I'm in Aisha's house wearing her dress, playing with her dolls, that's when Allah decides, decides to send me Revelation. So please don't hurt me because when I go see Hafsa, Allah doesn't send me Revelation. 
When I go see Sauda, Allah doesn't send me revelation. But for some reason, Allah happens to like Aisha too, my child bride. And when he sees me in her dress playing with dolls, he gets a kick out of it and he sends revelation on me. You get my point? This is Islam. This is what this sick pervert, this deceiver, son of Satan, wanted to defend. This pervert he calls a prophet. He deserves the hell that he's burning in. Glory to Jesus Christ. All right, one more question. One more question. Question. Any other question? No other questions? I'll call it a night. No, I can't help you. Nathan, what about Matthew 16, 28? I've already answered that question. What about it, though? What about Matthew 16, 28? Too many questions going by, and I'm trying to keep up. Anyway. One more question, guys, and so we can call it a day. I don't know how much more clear I can make it that when it says Enoch did not see death, it means death as we experience it on earth where a person dies and his body is buried. Do you need me to repeat it 50 more times before you get it? Uh, you're actually lying, Ar Arius Darling. I know you want to justify Muhammad, that sick pervert. I just told you that Jesus said God's standard is male and female and Paul confirms it in 1 Corinthians 7. So don't be that stupid to embarrass yourself. Folks, if there's no questions, then I'm going to call it a day. Because some of the questions you're asking me, really, I, I don't feel ans like answering them. Why wouldn't he know the divine name? Okay. Well, yeah, that's too fast, yeah. Yeah, too fast. I don't know. There's some questions. Jonah 2 6 and Matthew 61 8, which I've already answered. Guys, you know what? I don't want to disappoint you, but yeah, it's already over two hours. Johannes, Johannes, brother, you know, if there's an Assyrian that's going to cause me a heart attack, it's going to be you. You know that, La Johannes? Johannes, you know, if there's an Assyrian that's going to make me have a heart attack, it's going to be you. Do you know why? You always ask me questions that either I've already addressed in the session. Or that go off topic. Johannes, you haven't been here from the beginning. Already explain. The, you're not a Syrian? You mean all this time when you pretended to be a Syrian and told me you're a Syrian? Khuni, how are you, Khuni? You were masquerading. You were false advertising. So you're another Yahudi Mossad pretending to be a Syrian to infiltrate the ranks of Assyrians? Oh, Aramean. Oh, so you're not a Syrian. Go back and listen to the session from the beginning. Listen to the session from the beginning. I addressed the book of Enoch. Uh, Faith love, hold on. You said, are we on the end of the day? Well, here it's 324, my time. It's still not the end of the day. Are you in UK? If you're in UK, it's the end of the day. So it depends on what part of the earth you're at, Faith love. If you're in the UK, it's the end of the day. But here in America, it's still 324. It's afternoon. So no, for me, we're not at the end of the day. Come on, one more chance at asking a question. I got to go. Okay, I'm trying to figure out. Okay, folks, God willing, I'll be back on. I may surprise you. I may be back on tonight, late night. I may be back on 1 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, which should be what? 7 a.m. in UK. I may be. If not, look for me tomorrow, God willing, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, God willing. Lord bless you guys. I will see you tomorrow. Amanda, say hi to my, my, bro, my bro. Don't forget, Amanda, when I come to San Diego, I need a place to stay. You got to hook me up. You got to ask some Christian brothers and sisters. He's coming. You don't want to get a hotel because homie don't play that. Homie don't play that, sister. Homie don't play that. I don't got a money tree. And if you're on Facebook, contact me there. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Lord bless you guys.
I'll see you tomorrow.